Hello, and welcome virtually to the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars. My name is Christopher Sands, and I'm director of the Canada Institute here at the Wilson Center. It's our pleasure to be able to host the experts meeting of the Canada US Law Institute, one of the oldest and most prestigious organizations working between Canada and the United States to promote mutual understanding and to deal with some of the important legal issues that can divide our two countries. To open us up today, I'm going pleased to introduce a good friend, Stephen Petrus. He is director of the Frederick K. Cox International Law Center at the Case Western Reserve University School of Law and the U.S. Director of the Canada U.S. Law Institute. I should note, though, since this is a, a meeting full of lawyers, uh, we were lucky to get Steve. Uh, he spent 20 years as, uh, as a leading light in the legal world working at Baker and Hostetler, a pretty well-known firm in Washington, Cleveland, and just about everywhere else. So over to you, Steve, and, and welcome to everyone to this QSLE event. And thank you, Chris, and welcome everyone to uh, the Canada US Law Institute program on taking control. The United States and Canada respond to supply chain challenges from China. And it's a pleasure to welcome everyone on behalf of the Canada United States Law Institute, which is in its 41st year, started in 1976. And we have our two uh, chairs here. And I wanted to say just a brief word about the program. We're going to um, introduce our two co-chairs, our two esteemed co-chairs, and then the program, uh, once we have our keynote speech, will be taken over by Ted Perrin, our managing director, and he'll direct us for the rest of the program and coordinate the questions and answers. So at this time, I'd like to introduce our two co-chairs to say a few words. First, I wanna introduce Jim Peterson, former Minister of International Trade of Canada and a longstanding member of the Executive Committee of the Canada U.S. Law Institute. Jim, over to you. Oh, you're on mute, Jim. Oh yeah, thank you so much. Uh, you've been a great, you've given us great leadership on this thing and I wanna thank you and Ted for all you've done to make it possible. And certainly thank Chris for joint venturing this one with us uh, from his institute. Uh, I'm also very fortunate to have Jim Blanchard as a co-chair of, of Coosley Executive Committee. Uh, Jim is a remarkable guy and is a wonderful storyteller. And uh, I want to thank our executive committee members, and particularly Larry Herman, who was responsible for getting our keynote Canadian speaker here today, and also uh, Perrin Beatty, a Canadian uh, Chamber of Commerce president. Uh, this supply chain stuff is very near and dear to me. Uh, our dishwasher went in the blink. We bought a new one at Best Buy. It was delivered to our house, the repairman came open up the box and two of the little, four little wheels on the bottom were missing. So maybe 50 cents worth of equipment. Well, instead of getting two wheels, they came and picked the whole thing up, repackaged it and brought me another new one that had four wheels in the bottom. Uh, they couldn't find those wheels. Uh, secondly, our furnace went on the blink, the fan on the, the, the motor fan uh, kicked out uh, they said it would take probably up to two months or more to get a new little motor fan. So what happens? We need a furnace going. We get a new one. I'm looking forward to the solutions you people will come up today uh, in terms of how my supply chain can be better. And uh, I thank you very much for making all of this possible. Thank, thank you very much, Jim. And uh, again, we want to thank, and we're so proud to be teaming with the Canada Institute at the Wilson Center. And thank you again, Chris, for working together with us. Chris, of course, is an outstanding member of our executive committee. 
Now, it's my honor to introduce Jim Blanchard. Jim is a former U.S. Congressman from the state of Michigan, former governor of the state of Michigan, and former U.S. Ambassador to Canada. And Jim is going to introduce our keynote speaker. Jim Blanchard, over to you. Thank you, Steve. And again, thank you to Chris Sands for your leadership at the Woodrow Wilson Center, the Canada Institute. Steve, for your help. Ted Perrin, thank you for your coordinating skills. And Jim Peterson, for those of you who are watching or will be watching, um, I've worked with Jim Peterson now for over 20 years, really, at least since 1993, um, on a lot of different matters. And we're not only colleagues in, in uh, public service, but personal family friends as well. So I'm always honored to be with Jim and to stay in touch with his family, Heather and his uh, brother and sister-in-law. Um, you know, I grew up on the in Ferndale, Michigan, which is about you know 10 miles from Windsor. And so I was fully aware even before I got into all the politics uh, about the integrated nature of our economies. Um, and supply chain is really so directly related to that. Yesterday, we had some elections in the US. Uh, and what's interesting was that one of the most often mentioned issues was the rising prices for food, for gasoline, I know, of course, in Michigan, the, the, the auto companies' parking lots are full of vehicles waiting for computer chips from China and Taiwan. Um, you really have a hard time ordering a new car. And of course, we have an integrated automotive market with Canada. Uh, by the way, used cars prices are up 40%. And that you could go on and on with food processing, agriculture, energy, steel, aluminum, hopefully there's some relief there. Um, we have this integrated economy and we need to work together on all these things. I should say one bit of really good news is yesterday the Senate or the day before approved David Cohen as United States ambassador to uh, Canada. So that's good. He will no longer have a vacancy there. I'm sure he'll be sworn in soon and be in Ottawa. So I'm really happy about that. Let me just also say that um, um, I've worked on U.S. Canada issues since 1975, when I was uh, in a, a new member of the United States Congress, and I got involved with Canada on acid rain, trying to combat that. Um, and I got involved with the Canadian Embassy, and I, of course, learned long before I went to Ottawa. Years later, that in terms of diplomats, Canada always sends its very best to the United States. No disrespect intended to the United Kingdom or France. Those are important. So are other places, China and Japan, but the very best come to Washington. And so it's my pleasure to introduce John Layton, who is the economic minister at the Embassy of Canada. John has had two decades of experience uh, in working with the Canadian government and international issues. But everything from, first of all, his Portfolio now is trade, economic, and business development programs. Uh, he is a minister of eco economic minister in the embassy here. But he were, he was previously executive director of trade remedies at Global Affairs Canada. He served as one of Canada's NAFTA negotiators for Chapter Nine dispute. He's worked with the WTO. He's worked on fishery issues. Fisheries, by the way, tough issues. Uh, I've dealt with those over the years. He started at Canada's Customs and Excise and. He's just heavily involved in almost anything that goes on on the economic front or trade front with the U.S. And he also has worked on the Canada-U.S. Beyond the Border Agreement. And he has worked, as I said earlier, with the WTO. He's been head of Canada's delegation for North American steel trade. And he's previously worked in Tokyo, which had to be fabulous training and experience, as well as Canada's mission at the WTO in Geneva but he brings a very wealth of experience. He's also from Nova Scotia, beautiful Nova Scotia. And we're very pleased to have John Layton with us today. We appreciate your presence very, very much. and look forward to your remarks. Thank you very much, uh, Governor Blatchard. I really appreciate your introduction and, and for uh, getting out of your way to, to tell everyone where I'm from. I'm a proud blue noser and I forgot to put that in my bio. Um, I really appreciate the opportunity to, to speak uh, to such a wonderful group of uh, supporters and friends of the uh, Canada-US relationship. 
Um, Ambassador Hillman Sensor regrets for not being able to join us, and I uh, appreciate your flexibility in allowing you to, to uh, take her place. Um, so, with the theme on uh, Canada and US responses to China's supply chain challenges, I hope you'll forgive me if I, I, I focus my remarks a bit less directly on China and a bit more on what Canada and the United States can do to address our supply chain challenges. And unfortunately, Minister Peterson, I won't be able to fix your, uh, your furnace problems. Um, I was speaking to someone in Washington uh, recently about trade policy in China, and they said that China is the most important trade policy issue that we're facing today. And they're clearly not Canadian, although I did agree with them that, that it's, a, it's a very important issue. Um, as a Canadian, I'd like to touch on a few, uh, few things that are, are really of great interest to Canada. Starting with the, and maybe I'll start with the, the uh, beginning with the COVID pandemic and how it highlighted the importance of resilient uh, Canada US supply chain. You know, like all governments around the world, um, you know, uh, fighting the pandemic was really, it has been the most important challenge for the Canadian government since early 2020. And protecting the health and safety of Canadians is, uh, is primordial. And also ensuring economic recovery and uh, economic stability. It was, it was really a, another example of the close collaboration of Canada and the United States when our two governments implemented coordinated decisions to protect our people and restrict our shared border in both directions. Uh, this, this unprecedented action was really a keen reminder about that you know, no two nations depend on each other more than Canada and the United States for their mutual prosperity and security. And it highlights absolutely the importance of our land border uh, because we not only sell to each other, but of course we, we make things together and uh, our trade is primarily with immediate goods. And uh, you know, these goods go into final products that we either sell to each other or, uh, or to the rest of the world. And I think a, a great example is how I think 60% uh, of Canadian exports to the United States are used in the production of uh, goods in the United States. And, uh, a lot of those imports, I think it's something like most of the Canadian imports to the United States uh, have 20% US content. Uh, and in some sectors like machinery and automobiles, it's, uh, it's significantly higher. And I think it's fitting that during the pandemic, uh, in July of 2020, the new uh, updated NAFTA came into effect. And uh, NAFTA has contributed significantly to economic prosperity in North America in the past 25 years. And Canada and Mexico worked very closely with the previous administration in the United States to uh, update and modernize NAFTA. And, uh, but I, I think our, our main objective was really to protect the integrated supply chains that have developed over decades. And uh, I think now that we have the new modernized USMCA, uh, it really provides a strength and foundation uh, for the future. But back to the challenges of the, of the pandemic. Um, you know, when we were working together with the United States on the border, um, you know, keeping our supply chains working was a, was a prime uh, interest uh, when we closed the, the border to a non-essential crossing. And, uh, you know, we made sure that life-saving goods like food and medical supplies could still flow freely. We uh, made sure that essential workers could uh, continue to cross the border, like the uh, 1,500 Canadian healthcare workers that work in Detroit hospitals and care centers, uh, and the thousands of professional truck drivers that crisscross North America keeping uh, goods on our shelves. And yeah, I think it's really quite remarkable that despite the drop in passenger volumes um, and traffic across the border by more than 90% in 2020, the rates of cross-border trucking actually increased. And by uh, September, 2020, the trucking volume was up 8% um, compared to the same period before the, before the pandemic. And then uh, just quickly, you know, at home, Canada took measures to make sure that the border was still, uh, 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 that important goods would still keep crossing the border. Um, we took temporary measures to liberalize trade in medical products, including waiving duties and taxes on imported goods for emergency use. Uh, and we haven't imposed any export restrictions on um, medical products. And we also relaxed certain regulatory requirements and approval procedures for PPE, uh, PPE and other medical materials. And I think overall, um, 
again, despite closing the borders to non-essential travel, our uh, bilateral trade flows ended up being 85% of uh, the levels of 2019, which is really a remarkable outcome uh, given the, the, the border restrictions. And I think uh, all of our work together on the border and on uh, um, medical uh, supply chains has really underscored Canada as a reliable trading partner um, for critical goods. And uh, you know the overall outcome of our work is an expanded and strengthened North American medical supply base. And you know, looking ahead, I think it's it's important uh, and clear that the economic recovery in Canada and the United States will be better uh, as we uh, um, better and stronger and more enduring as as we work together to move forward. However, you know, we did learn lessons from the pandemic, and we learned that. Um, especially in the early months of the pandemic, that there are uh, supply chain vulnerabilities for both of our, our countries. Now, maybe I'll, I'll pause there for a second and finally mention China. Um, you know, I, I think supply chains drive productivity and, and economic growth and are largely determined by market forces. Um, but, uh, you know, a key supply chain uh, concern during the pandemic was our reliance on countries like China for key goods, which has really prompted a serious reflection. And of course, there are other issues at play. Um, you know, Canada shares uh, US and other countries' concerns about China's actions with respect to trade, intellectual property, human rights, rule of law, security issues, and industrial policies. I also need to mention, you know, I think it's important that, that, that how pleased the government of Canada is that uh, we have uh, Michael Kovrig and Michael Pevor uh, back on Canadian soil after over a thousand days uh, that haven't been arbitrarily detained in China. You know, the, the support from the international community um, uh, was really key in reaching this, this happy uh, uh, resolution, including those who endorsed the uh, Declaration Against Arbitrary Detention and State to State Relations. You know, I think from this experience, we recognize that, you know, the world has changed and perspectives of Canadians have changed. And, uh, you know, we, we can't simply return to, to business as usual. Um, I think I think it's fair to say we'll continue our, to pursue our interests in China uh, based on international rules and results for Canadians. But the Canadian government will also be uh, firm in defending Canadian values and interests. Um, including as they relate to our shared concerns around human rights and international labor standards. Um, we've taken uh, trade related measures in response to concerns of uh, human rights, the situation in uh, Xinjiang uh, and in coordination with the US. Uh, Global Affairs Canada has also issued a business advisory to caution Canadian businesses about the risks of uh, supply chain exposure to entities that engage in human rights abuses, including forced labor in Xinjiang and uh, involving the Uyghur ethnic minorities. So Canada is, is, uh, is very uh, um, keen on working with the United States and other like-minded countries to address global issues, or to uh, address our joint concerns, including in multilateral organizations. Um, we do recognize that there are areas where um, you know, we need to work with China to address global issues, such as the climate change and health issues. Um, and I think as Canada and the United States work together uh, to align our approaches on issues of common concern, we also need to work together to ensure that we have secure and resilient supply chains uh, in critical areas. Now, our leaders understand that. Um, that was the focus in February 2021 when Prime Minister Trudeau and President Biden met uh, for a virtual summit um, just a, a month after President Biden's inauguration. Uh, it was his first bilateral meeting with a, a foreign counterpart since he took office. And uh, the President and Prime Minister, during that summit, they spoke of the uh, importance of our deeply interconnected and mutually beneficial economic relationship and they launched a strategy to strengthen the, the, uh, our supply chain security. And that was through the uh, commitment of the roadmap for the new US-Canada partnership. And in that roadmap, the leaders committed to working together to build necessary supply chains to make Canada and the United States global leaders in all aspects of, for instance, battery development and, uh, and production, as well as to strengthen our work on the Canada-US Critical Minerals Action Plan which would hopefully target net zero industrial transformation, batteries for zero emission vehicles, and renewable energy storage. These commitments recognized our deeply integrated supply chains, 
and the, the potential of our enduring relationship in supporting enhanced economic prosperity and regional security. Now, it's interesting that the, uh, this roadmap uh, was immediately followed by the uh, presidential executive order on supply chains um, that was also came out in February of this year. And uh, while that obviously uh, was focused on strengthening the resilience of supply chains in key sectors in the United States, the executive order also placed a priority on close cooperation with uh, uh, on resilient supply chains with allies and partners who share U.S. values. And uh, this would foster collective economic and national security and uh, strengthen the capacity to respond to international uh, disasters and emergencies. So that executive order launched a 100-day uh, supply chain review uh, focused on four critical products, which included semiconductors, critical minerals, advanced batteries, and pharmaceuticals. And then resulting uh, reports came out with a broad list of recommendations and uh, uh, and launched uh, further reviews in other sectors, including uh, uh, information technology, energy, transportation, and agriculture. Now, Canada was uh, we tried to be active in those reviews, and we submitted uh, our formal comments, and several of them, including on uh, electric um, electric vehicle batteries, uh, strategic and critical minerals, and on agricultural commodities and food products. And uh, you know, our, our key message is really that Canada is a key ally. In looking at these issues. Um, in fact, just earlier this week, uh, Prime Minister Trudeau uh, participated in the summit on supply chain resilience, which was hosted by President Biden on the margins of the G20 in Rome. And uh, the Prime Minister affirmed Canada's commitment to working together to build resilient supply chains and address unfair and non market trade practices. Um, the discussion between the, uh, the G20 leaders, I think there were 16 of them that participated in this supply chain event. Uh, they focused their discussion on the need to expand supply chain transparency and information sharing efforts and cooperate on investments in key materials needed for our collective climate and sustainability goals. I think of particular importance is one thing they talked about was the need to uh, have predictability with reliable uh, to reliable supply chains and the need to reinforce and foster our longstanding economic partnerships and supply chain relationships. And that, that's really a key, uh, a key uh, issue for Canada is the predictability for our supply chain. And this message uh, was actually reinforced yesterday by our Minister of um, Innovation, Science and Industry who was in Washington uh, yesterday and today. Uh, and he's discussing issues with his uh, US counterparts, uh, particularly on supply chain collaboration. And, uh, Minister Champagne said yesterday, uh, you know, a regional supply chain focus is really necessary to make the North American continent more self-reliant and less, um, less vulnerable to offshore forces, and also to leverage, of course, the updated USMCA. He also noted um, that the vulnerability experienced by North American economy at the start of the pandemic, including you know, in particular, the shortages of uh, PPE and vaccines um, must not be repeated. And that uh, much of it, you know, he said was due to our reliance on China, which, you know, must now be addressed. So I'll turn now to some of the work we're doing in this regard to, uh, to, to try to address these supply chain issues uh, related to uh, uh, critical supply chains. Um, you know, in Canada, we've also matched out uh, some of our supply chain vulnerabilities uh, and groups such as the Global Affairs Canada's Office of the Chief Economist that have led ana analytical work in this regard. And our, our work also continues with the United States government on the Canada-US supply chain strategy as announced in the leadership roadmap. And uh, Canada and the United States also have some existing uh, um, bilateral structures that are related to supply chains, such as the Joint Action Plan of Critical Minerals, and the air, in the area of defense and security. Just to briefly, I'll talk about critical minerals uh, because I think that they're very important uh, in, our, in, uh, in a lot of our uh, new and emerging supply chains. Um, our joint action plan with the United States uh, will help address security and defense concerns, facilitate greater mineral trade and investment, and increase industry competitiveness in both Canada and the United States. And this is important because critical minerals are in great global demand. Uh, both Canada and the United States need them to advance high-tech industries, our continental security, 
and the global transition to a low carbon future. Overall, Canada is an important supplier of critical minerals. Uh, we uh, are a supplier of 13 of the 35 minerals that the United States has identified as critical, including aluminum, uranium, and graphite. And we're one of the only sources of certain minerals such as cesium, a crucial metal for building uh, highly accurate atomic clocks and GPS devices. Canada is also a, a majority supplier of critical minerals such as rubidium used in high-tech vacuum tubes, tubes uh, potash, and magnesium, which is used in manufacturing lightweight items for vehicles, uh, vehicle engines, and uh, mobile phones. And in, in addition to this government collaboration, there's also a lot of business to business collaboration in these areas um, where there's a lot of, uh, where they recognize the potential for collaborating with like-minded and secure partners. And it's only natural, I think, to, to follow the discussion of critical minerals with, uh, by touching on the issue of defense and security. Um, the United States, I think, has long um, recognized that the world is safer uh, and more prosperous with the collaboration of its closest allies, and that our defense collaboration is key to uh, the stability and longevity of our supply chains. We're, uh, we're actually integrated partners and integral partners in one another's uh, national security. We share the most integrated defense industrial base in the world, founded on long-standing production agreements stretching back to the 1960s. Through this uh, cross-border defense trade and the US uh, national technology and industrial base, where Canada is uh, recognized as a domestic supplier in US law, we've established efficient and long-standing uh, defense supply chains. And while this uh, strong industrial base is primarily about our, shape, our shared security, it also brings tremendous commercial benefits to our two countries. So after touching on the important work that we're doing uh, on supply chains uh, with the United States, I need to take a minute to mention, you know, one of the key tasks that Canadian representatives from the United States uh, have on, on our plate. And, and that's unfortunately defending our integrated supply chains from getting unintentionally sideswiped by US policies. While such policies uh, never appear to target Canada, uh, discriminatory measures that undermine our supply chains harm both Canadian and US workers and businesses and only make it harder to uh, achieve our goals. For instance, um, one issue that uh, has, has been on our minds is the inclusion of expanded domestic content requirements, uh, known as Buy America, of course, in the infrastructure package that's now be uh, before the host. Included deep in that legislation is a series of provisions that uh, expand Buy America's uh, requirements to construction materials, such as plastic and polymer-based products, uh, which is PVC, composite building materials, and polymers used in fiber optic cables, uh, glass products, including optic glass, uh, and even lumber and, and drywall materials. The, uh, the draft legislation would also extend biomarker requirements to a whole new range of infrastructure projects not currently covered by these rules, including buildings, broadband infrastructure, and, ele and the electric grid. We, uh, we recognize the U.S. desire to uh, support American workers and jobs, uh, but applying domestic content requirements like Biomerica against Canadian inputs uh, will have the opposite effect and will negatively impact U.S. jobs and U.S. companies that rely on cross-border uh, supply chains. Likewise, another issue that's currently in the U.S. draft legislation is a proposed uh, tax incentive for electric vehicles. Uh, that's in the Build Back Better Act, or also the, known as the Budget Reconciliation Bill. And that includes protectionist and unlawful, you know, according under the USMCA uh, elements that discriminate against vehicles and parts that are produced in Canada and, you know, significant concern for Canada and our automakers and our unions as they risk, um, these provisions risk undoing decades of migration in the auto, in the auto sector. In fact, as, as I touched on before, the auto sector is one of the uh, supply chains that are most intricately linked uh, between Canada and the United States. And by the time a car rolls off the assembly line, the parts and components have crossed the border multiple times. So the, uh, and, and I think the vehicles assembled in Canada are on average uh, made up of 50% uh, US content, content as uh, Canada imports more than $21 billion a year in 
uh, US auto parts to go into our uh, auto manufacturing. So any measures that harm Canadian automobile production will also result in US lost US jobs in the Great Lakes region. So our message to the administration is really that you know, we, we should be focusing our efforts on how we work together to meet our shared climate action objectives, which includes transition to electric vehicles, and how Canada could be a strategic partner as a stable, secure, and trusted supplier of critical minerals for batteries. Uh, and you know, Canada is, is a source of all the minerals required for battery production, including uh, we have large uh, nickel and cobalt reserves. So looking ahead, rather than ending on a, a totally pessimistic note, I, I'd rather emphasize the enthusiasm because there is enthusiasm in Canada for uh, working with the United States on our uh, Canada-US roadmap, roadmap objectives on supply chains. Work continues uh, to assess the bilateral analysis and supply chain vulnerabilities and uh, opportunities for deeper integration. The Canada-US relationship is really one, uh, a partnership of neighbors, forged by a shared geography, uh, similar values and common interests, deep people-to-people -people connections, uh, and powerful multi-layered economic and security ties. And not to forget China, um, as we work to address the new challenges that lie ahead with uh, market distorting practices, forced labor, and economic coercion, the Canada and United States will need to not only consolidate our partnership, but to create new languages and resiliencies among ourselves. Thank you very much for uh, allowing me to, uh, to provide that uh, talk. All right. Thank you so much, Minister Layton, for your time and uh, comments here today, very informative. Uh, we do have a few questions coming in from the audience. And to those of you listening live um, on the web uh, webpage, there is an, uh, an option for you to submit questions uh, for uh, Minister Layton. So let me check here. OK, Mr. Minister Layton, I have one here from uh, Trevor Hallness, a law student, and he writes, you have, min you have mentioned critical minerals several times. Um, how does Canada protect cr critical mineral resources? Um, while the Investment Canada Act does not necessarily require review of mm -hmm. acquisitions of mineral resources prior to production. That's a good question. Um, I think I think that I, I'm not sure exactly about the provisions of the Investment Canada Act and how they would apply to critical minerals, but I think that that's uh, that's certainly an issue that's uh, of great importance as we uh, work with the United States on our critical minerals collaboration strategy, and uh, and I think it's it's uh, it's an important part of those discussions about how how we uh, use our resources in North American supply chains to advance North American interests and how that would, uh, and I think that by bilateral collaboration, um, we'll be able to address um, issues and concerns we may have with the uh, investment by uh, other parties and other resources. Thank you for that. Um, this next question uh, turns to your comments on how the United States can and Canada can address some of the vulnerabilities in our supply chains that we're seeing right now. Um, the, the requester asks, what specific steps um, could Canada and the US take, uh, if not already taking, to address some of the issues that we're seeing with disruption, uh, unavailability of, uh, of parts and, and inputs and those sorts of things? Well, I think the, you know, a lot of, a lot of our, our focus and, and what I was referring to was probably more related to the critical supply chains in, in, a, in a pandemic and emergency preparedness sense. So vaccines and PPE, um, as well as mentioning, you know, uh, new and emerging supply chains where, where it's important to have uh, secure supply chains in North America, particularly uh, um, batteries and electric vehicle um, uh, production and, and then climate action as well. In terms of the vulnerabilities with our supply chains currently, in terms of logistics and, and uh, shortages and, and ports, I mean, I think that's something that uh, that um, 
our transportation experts uh, are, are, are looking at and will work together where, where possible. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I think we're also concerned about the uh, shortage of semiconductors. And I know that uh, while Canada is not a, a major manufacturer of semiconductors, we do have an industry and, and that's something that we're interested in, in working together with, with like-minded countries to see how we can uh, try and secure uh, those supply chains. All right, thank you. Uh, and I think uh, Chris Sands uh, has, a, has a comment to uh, put to you as well. Um, sure. Uh, thanks, John, so much for coming. And I really appreciate the presentation. I, I just sort of a two-parter question. Looking at moving towards electric vehicles, I wonder um, what Canada has, has been able to do with the Biden administration to make some progress in not having us basically have a subsidy war like we used to have in the 80s over new plant locations, try to work cooperatively to provide the kind of support infrastructure subsidies and other things that are necessary to bring us more of an electric future. Um, and then I have two category, two sort of related questions. One is um, on the electricity grid side in terms of providing strong base load um, for an expanded electricity demand, which would follow electric vehicles. I know Canada um, has had a bit of a setback on hydroelectricity through Maine to Massachusetts, uh, but not only hydroelectricity, but also uh, nuclear, small modular nuclear, which has a, a lot of promise for the American Midwest and other parts of the country. Um, how can Canada be part of, of the grid expansion that would maybe, uh, that would support us moving towards electric vehicles? Thanks for that question, Chris. Uh, there's a lot there. I guess starting with electric vehicles, um, you know, I mean, Canada is always concerned about about subsidy wars. Um, you know, we're a smaller country, and and it's uh, some countries have deeper pockets. Um, although in this case, it's less of a subsidy war and more of a, a discrimination war of uh, of shutting out foreign vehicles from having access to the uh, tax incentives in the United States. Canada has tax incentives for electric vehicles. Um, right now, I think they're about the same as the current US incentives, um, but they're, uh, they're not, um, they're available for any, uh, any type of electric vehicle, no matter where they're made. Um, so I think that's really the key you know, I, I think where both governments are investing a lot in climate action and a lot to uh, encourage uh, emissions reduction. And I think, uh, you know, so we support that, but um, we also support doing it in such a way that doesn't, isn't used to shut one of us out of the other's market. The, uh, the question about the electricity grid is, is an excellent one because, you know, it's, it's really quite amazing how, how integrated our electrical grid is and how many uh, uh, cross-border connections there are with electricity um, that exist. I think that the big challenge though, is how do we increase our, the supply of uh, lower zero emission electricity, especially as we're, we're trying to move to uh, um, eliminate uh, uh, gasoline powered vehicles and move to electric vehicles. We have to have clean energy in order to, to run those. Um, certainly I, I, it was a setback for, uh, the main referendum um, looks to be a setback in terms of expanding hydro Quebec's uh, electricity exports to the United States. But I think that's something we have to work on to make sure that we have secure supplies of clean energy uh, in North America and Canadian hydroelectricity, I think is, a, is, a, is an obvious part of, uh, of increasing that supply. Um, this, the uh, small modular nuclear reactors you know, in terms of emissions, I think are uh, seem to be a, a key technology that's that's worth pursuing, and I know it's something that the Canadian government is uh, is working with uh, to to uh, develop this new uh, new technology. And uh, you know, I think that's another area where countries can do better. Um, thanks very much. Ted, do you mind if I ask him one more? I don't want to push my luck. That's all right, Chris. Uh, we, I think we have time for just about one more. Thank you. All right. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so my other question, John, is about is about the border. 
you know, with the COVID border restrictions, they haven't interfered with the goods flow. So we kept our supply chains going there. But what I think all of us here have heard in different ways is that for executives, white collar workers, professional services, uh, the lack of the ability to go across the border has hurt new business uh, recruitment and some of those other things. Now that we're starting to ease the restrictions, do you see that flow of people uh, strengthening our supply chains and, and perhaps helping us to, uh, to update them for a post-COVID world. I think the I think as we we're moving towards uh, you know well our, our borders as of November the eighth uh, will be open both ways at the land border uh, for people to cross and I think that will be uh, significant for for us to get back to uh, get back to normal uh, people to people ties. Um, I think it was, you know, one positive thing of the new USMCA was that it kept the, uh, the the rules for labor mobility, which I think was was really important for Canada. Um, but I, I agree that the you know one of the the real one of the problems with the pandemic of the many was was that it did it, it did cut off the the, the people to people ties um, in the in a business sense and for, sense and for, for, for professionals. And I think we're one of the things we're interested in doing is really working with the United States to to uh, to look at what happened and how we dealt with things, which I, I think was 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 relatively successful. But to see where we can learn um, from that experience and to be better prepared if we have to deal with this again, and how we can uh, um, how we can try to minimize the disruptions while, of course, protecting the the health and safety of our citizens. I am going to call everybody back. Thank you for sticking with us during our short break. Um, a couple of words before we get to our uh, next comments and panel. First, um, thank you uh, so much to the Wilson Center for partnering with us on this. Chris Sands, as always, um, your input and contributions to Coosley are, are appreciated. Uh, also wanted to mention uh, Wilson's uh, point person on this. Zoe Reed has done a phenomenal job. Um, arranging the logistics of this uh, behind the scenes. So even if you don't see her today, uh, Zoe, thank you for all the time and attention you've put into making this a success as well. Um, also a couple of thank yous to our sponsors, um, Cleveland Cliffs Inc. Uh, from here in Cleveland, Ohio, uh, who many of you know well, uh, is generously supporting us uh, in, in putting this uh, program together. James Graham, who will be on our second panel as moderator, is instrumental in that as well as helping get uh, panelists, experts, true experts on these topics. So thank you to Cleveland Cliffs, as well as DLA Piper. Uh, James Blanchard, who you heard from earlier, uh, is with them as well as Rick Newcomb, who's also on our executive committee. And they both have been big supporters of Coosley in general, as well as making this meeting happen today. So thank you to our sponsors and the fine folks at Wilson. Um, joining us at this point, um, one of our two uh, co-presidents, uh, Michael Scharf, uh, Dean at Case Western Reserve Law School uh, in Cleveland, uh, is with us. Thank you, Dean Scharf, for being here today. I'll turn it over to you uh, for a few brief comments on uh, what we do at Coosley and our two law schools. So thank you. Thank you very much, Ted. And I will be very brief because we're all very eager for this excellent panel that we're about to see. Um, Case Western Reserve University has been partnering with Western Ontario School of Law for the Canada US Law Institute for almost 50 years. And every year we do a major conference and for the last decade, we've been doing these experts meetings. We're, we're very fortunate to have the partnership of the Wilson Center for the last couple of years. Um, in previous years, we've had Steptoe and Johnson partner with us and DLA Piper has played a significant role. Um, this organization was the brainchild of Sid Picker, who passed away a year ago. He was one of the professors from Case Western Reserve. And it has now come under the leadership of Steve Petrus from Case Western, Kai Comedy from Western Ontario, and Ted Perrin, who um, runs the show and organizes everything in such a great way. Thank you, Ted. Um, we also are so fortunate to have James Blanchard and Jim Peterson as the two leaders of our executive committee that create the vision and help us get the amazing speakers for these kinds of events. Uh, this particular experts meeting is one of the most important we've had. 
um, taking control, the US and Canada respond to China's supply chain challenge. That's on everybody's mind. I mean, you, you can't do a single thing right now in, in your legal career, in your business career, in your life without running into the challenges that have been created because of the supply chain interruptions and especially the role of China. So to be able to discuss what the United States and Canada are each individually and jointly doing to address this huge challenge is really an exciting opportunity for us. And we are so grateful that we have been able to bring together the kind of expertise that you'll be hearing and that you've already heard earlier today. So with that, Ted, I'm happy to welcome everybody on behalf of the two founding institutions and to kick things off for the next panel. Thank you, Michael, as always. Um, turning to our next panel, I will give a, just a brief introduction and turn it over to our chair. Uh, Mr. Lawrence Herman uh, has been a long standing supporter of Coosley, uh, one of our stalwarts on the executive committee. Um, I'll leave it to Larry to talk a little bit more about uh, his role and then his two excellent panelists. But again, thank you, Larry, for all you do. And uh, over to you. Thank you, Ted. And uh, let me reciprocate by saying how how much I've enjoyed working with you, with uh, Steve Petrus, with Michael Scharf uh, over many, many years. Without uh, the three of you uh, pulling together, I don't think uh, our organization would, would uh, be where it is today. So thank you all. Uh, and thank Chris Sands and the uh, Canada Institute and Wilson Center for their support in pulling this together. Now, uh, we have a, uh, a terrific uh, panel uh, that's going to address the issues facing Canada and the United States in terms of uh, responding to the China challenge. And the focus is on uh, supply chain issues, resilience of supply chain, security of supply chains, and a whole range of, of uh, related issues. We couldn't have a better uh, couple of panelists. Anna Ashton, uh, who is uh, Vice President of, uh, of uh, International Relations at the U.S.-China uh, Business Council, has had long experience both in the public domain as a, uh, 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 an expert in the U.S. Defense Department, and uh, then uh, being uh, very important in her role with the US-China Business Council. So she has both a government uh, and a private sector uh, perspective. Pittman Potter, uh, a distinguished academic uh, from the University of British Columbia who has vast experience on matters related to China, both as an academic uh, and as a, uh, an advisor to one of Canada's leading uh, law firms. Uh, he has written enormously uh, on the Canada-China uh, relationship uh, and on China in general. Now, what we've decided in putting this panel together is that each of the panelists will take about 14 to 15 minutes uh, with their opening remarks. They can be less in terms of time, but hopefully not longer. Um, and that will allow us for uh, a good period of exchange exchanges, questions and answers, and further discussion uh, among and between the panelists. So let me start with uh, Anna Ashton and, and ask her if she could say, say a, a few, a few uh, remarks, and then I'll turn it over to, uh, to Pittman. Uh, and then we'll have a, uh, I hope, an energetic discussion uh, on these matters. So Anna, over to you. Sure, I was I was going to suggest that Pittman go first because I think he's uh, he has a broader perspective. Uh, but I'm happy to start with the um, lay of the land for how the Biden administration is approaching trade and uh, with China, the commercial relationship with China, and sort of uh, what we're looking at going forward. 
So uh, the Biden team's general orientation towards China is relatively consistent with that of the Trump administration um, in the sense that we're hearing officials characterize the relationship as one of competition with some shared interests, yes, but also conflicting interests as well as conflicting ideologies and values. Um, the Biden team, Biden team was expected for many months this year to roll out a comprehensive Biden team China strategy but this hasn't happened, uh, not in one fell swoop. And at this point, we shouldn't expect it to. Ambassador Catherine Tai spoke at CSIS in October and laid out a blueprint for what she called the initial steps that the administration will take in addressing the bilateral commercial relationship. Um, she talked about enforcing phase one commitments, saying that the United States is ready to re-engage with Chinese officials using that framework of the phase one deal, and that they intend to enforce China's purchase commitments and other elements of the agreement. Um, she talked about restarting some 301 tariff exclusions, but that hasn't really gotten underway yet. Um, she talked about addressing China's state-centric policies. So uh, everything that's market distorting, um, such as industrial subsidies, technology policies, and regulations that favor domestic enterprises. And finally, she talked about working with allies, which has been uh, a pillar of what the Biden administration has said they intend to have as their approach to China. In some ways, Tai's speech really raised more questions than, than answers, but to be fair, the Biden administration has been trying to thread a very small needle here, trying to coordinate a comprehensive approach to China policy that involves just a panoply of different issues, trade being just one of them, and it's really uh, unclear still from our perspective representing U.S. companies that do business in China, whether uh, trade is going to be a leading aspect of the Biden administration's engagement or more of a backseat aspect of the Biden administration's engagement. Um, overall, the Biden administration's approach to U.S.-China commercial engagement, like I said, remains very much a work in progress. But a couple of recent things that have happened, statements that have been made since Ambassador Tai gave her speech in October, give us a little bit of a clue as to where they might be going next. Uh, Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen told reporters this week that US Trade Representative Cap Catherine Tai could consider stabilizing and eventually reciprocally lowering some US-China tariffs uh, because that would have a disinflationary effect in the face of soaring prices in the United States. At the same time, she noted that USTR would continue to push for China to fulfill its commitments under the phase one trade deal though. Um, U.S. Trade Representative Catherine Tai still has not indicated that the U.S. will lower any tariffs, but she has mentioned the need for a recoupling of the two economies and approaching U.S.-China trade relations through the phrase, framework of phase one. And last week, she provided clues about what recoupling may mean, telling an audience that she aims to lower the temperature in the bilateral relationship and have, quote, a sober relationship and a sober conversation about aspects of the U.S.-China trade relationship that are working and should be able to work going forward. It's unclear to what extent uh, this actually can cool down the relationship, given that Tai also said that the United States will directly engage with China on industrial policy, taking all steps necessary to protect itself from adverse impacts of China's non-market practices. Uh, so it sounds like there are going to be some tough conversations in the near future. And there's a schedule of events that we can look forward to that may force some momentum uh, on this front. Tony Blinken and Chinese Foreign Minister Wang Yi met in Rome on Sunday, a rare in-person meeting and the latest in several bilateral engagements at different levels of the administration with their counterparts in China. And of course, we know that President Biden and President Xi will have a virtual leader summit possibly this month. And that, that should be very telling for how 2022 will unfold. But the Biden administration is not uh, operating in a vacuum. Sorry, I have dogs. Uh, Congress, hold on one second. Um, there are quite a few, Congress is also a major player creating a policy context as well as policy constraints for the Biden administration as it attempts to move forward with its China strategy. And there are uh, a number of legislative initiatives underway. We're headed into the midterm elections, which will introduce new drivers and complications both in Congress and in spillover uh, for Biden and his team. There has been just a prolific introduction of China-focused policy proposals 
arguably unprecedented in many ways. We're looking at 320 or so China-related proposals in this Congress just since January, uh, and there were more than 550 China-related proposals in the last Congress. This volume of China-related legislation is uh, sometimes double and more often triple what we've seen in Congress is going all the way back to the early 1980s, and nothing that's being introduced is particularly positive. Um, the idea of a bipartisan China consensus is something that, that gets talked about a lot in the press, especially when it comes to what's going on in Congress, but it's a little bit misleading. In many respects, given how little our two major parties agree on domestically, and given the razor thin majority that Democrats have on the Hill, um, there's sort of an, a need to invoke China as a hook for people in both parties pushing domestic initiatives and other policy priorities. So we're seeing a lot of uh, legislation that has China in it, but maybe actually domestic in its focus. Um, and even as China is getting invoked to get all sorts of things done that aren't even really necessarily about China, it's also increasingly complicating cooperation and emerging as a major area of contention between the parties, especially as we head into the midterm elections where both parties are going to want to position themselves as the better option for addressing the China challenge. It's really important in all of this that the United States be able to act together with its allies and trading partners as the Biden administration platform is intended to prioritize. One problem with the pressures coming from Congress regarding China policy is that they are largely um, directing unilateral action and unilateral approaches are likely to undermine US interests rather than accomplish much in the way of encouraging China to change various behaviors. Uh, the United States needs issue-based coalitions to deal with problematic Chinese behavior. And there are also areas where we need to work together with China to address common challenges that are more global. Uh, but even though multilateral engagement is a pillar of the Biden strategy in China, the Biden administration has emphasized this need for, the, for multilateral engagement, but hasn't actually um, taken concrete steps that are necessary to make that engagement happen, at least on the trade and commercial fronts. So for example, um, trade negotiations would seem to be an obvious and critical part of the equation here, but in order to negotiate trade negotiations, the Biden administration needs trade promotion authority, which expired this summer, and they haven't, they haven't requested that Congress renew it, even though uh, Republicans and Democrats on House Ways and Means have urged them to. Um, without trade promotion authority, it's going to be challenging to re-enter agreements we've already negotiated, like CPTPP, much less uh, establish new agreements, including agreements uh, with our neighbors like Canada, that might allow us to work together to address uh, supply chain issues. So I will, I will stop there and wait for the Q&A section and apologies again about my dogs. It's always good to have the human or the canine element injected into our proceedings, uh, Anna. So uh, that, that's, uh, that's fine. Uh, thank you very much for your remarks. We can't forget the role of the legislative branch in the United States in setting trade policy. The Congress has a role uh, that's of great importance. Uh, it distinguishes the US and Canada very much because our parliamentary system does not provide that degree of uh, involvement of our parliamentarians in setting trade policy. But enough said by me, I, I wanna now ask uh, Pittman Potter uh, for his remarks. Pittman, over to you. Well, thank you very much uh, and uh, greetings to all and thanks for the opportunity to share some thoughts with you. Uh, thanks especially to Larry Herman and the CUSLI team. And I just add to Pet, Ted Perrin's thanks given easier, uh, given earlier. Uh, the topic for me today is uh, Canadian policy responses to the China challenge. And the main points that I'll talk about are the contexts of domestic politics, which was, were just discussed and, and how important they are. Uh, Canadian resistance to uh, China's coercive diplomacy, uh, the re-enlivening, I describe it as, of Canadian and U.S. relations, and then uh, a brief point at the end on restoring trade and investment. So in terms of, uh, in terms of Canadian politics, uh, uh, as, as, uh, as, as we just heard, I think the domestic focus and the, uh, the issue of domestic politics is a critical context for these relationships. And not unlike uh, the United States, uh, Canadian politics is now, the policy process is, 
is sort of in a reassessment uh, mode, I think, and 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 uh, easy solutions are are not quite immediately obvious. Um, I think it's fair to say that the Meng Wanzhou matter was something of an earthquake in uh, Canadian attitudes about China. And the question is, what are the policy effects? And it's a bit early to tell, but there are some indications. Uh, first, uh, I think there's a general change in theme from confidence in the relationship to caution, a gradual decline in public opinion on China, which has been going on for several years, as documented by the Asia Pacific Foundation of Canada's annual polls. That gradual decline has accelerated over the Meng Wanzhou matter. Um, those who favor a close cooperative relationship with China, uh, whether it be in government or in the ruling uh, government party, the liberals or policy or academia, uh, they, they tend to be losing ground as the evidence of China's behavior sort of piles up. Uh, the interparliamentary alliance on China uh, is uh, specifically uh, designed to raise contrary and critical positions on China. Uh, there was certainly the sense of betrayal of a special relationship. Uh, uh, people will recall that when Hu Jintao visited uh, Canada in 2005, there was uh, an agreement on creating a strategic partnership. And I think the Meng Wanzhou matter, both in China and in Canada, was considered a, a betrayal of that. So what we're seeing going forward is an emphasis on selective engagement. And uh, something that I've uh, detected as, as uh, situational rather than relational emphasis, emphasis on case by case matters rather than uh, thinking about an overall cooperative relationship since that has uh, uh, really come a cropper a bit with the Meng Wanzhou matter. Uh, nonetheless, in the recent federal election in September, um, you know, China wasn't really that big an issue in the federal election that we just held. There was some conservative party attention to it, but generally the electorate focus was on other issues. So that, that says something. Um, we have a new foreign minister, uh, Minister Melanie Jolie, uh, who uh, promised to bring humility and audacity to her role, and, uh, and we'll see how that uh, plays out. The questions really for Canada are where to go and how to proceed after both the disruptions of both COVID and uh, the Meng Wanzhou matter. Now, I think it's also important to talk about the Chinese politics side of it. Um, uh, obviously, we can't talk about China without Xi Jinping, and, and there are some questions about his political health and the succession discussion uh, because of uh, ac inadequate access to information. We can't reach firm conclusions other than to say these are issues that are being uh, discussed. Uh, Xi Jinping's uh, recent uh, initiative on common prosperity is uh, clearly an effort to respond to the inequalities that have been created by China's phenomenal growth uh, and also sustainability challenges, but it certainly brings in a greater level of uh, state-centric policy um, uh, that was discussed by Ambassador Tai some time ago and mentioned just previously. So the common prosperity issue, but there are also some opposition to that within China, and so we'll have to see how that plays out. We have a pattern of internal authoritarianism, the social credit system, uh, artificial intelligence, surveillance, uh, cracks down, crackdowns on lawyers, the Xinjiang crisis, and so on. And, and I think the regime is looking at prosperity, common or otherwise, as a bit of a salve, and they have done that for quite some time. But the question is, what kind of prosperity and for whom? And those issues still remain and affect uh, China's behavior internationally with the United States and with Canada. There's also a level of international authoritarianism, and we see the attempt to, uh, to bully Canada over the deten detention of the two Michaels in the Meng Wanzhou matter. We see the uh, sanctions against Australia. We've seen the behavior in Hong Kong and Taiwan, although China would not consider those to be international issues. And I think uh, we see China's international activism calling for global governance reform, for a shared future. And in my, uh, sorry, in my, uh, in my current book that came out in January, I, I talk, it called Exporting Virtue, I discussed China's efforts to build an international consensus um, on uh, not only human rights, but also political governance that is favorable to it. So, so there are, that, that sets a bit of a context for uh, Canada's relations uh, with China. Now, I think the, uh, the most immediate impact of the Meng Wanzhou matter are Canadian efforts to resist uh, what they uh, describe, what, China, what the government describes as, as a coercive diplomacy uh, by China. So clearly the hostage diplomacy pattern uh, with the detention of the two Michaels um, has been a major concern. And of course, China, uh, Canada rather sponsored a uh, international declaration against arbitrary detention in state to state relationships, which both uh, uh, evidenced Canada's commitment to a multilateral approach, but also uh, infuriated uh, China. 
Um, uh, the government in Canada has also responded to Chinese activism in Canada, the uh, uh, United Front Work Department uh, efforts to, uh, to influence uh, Canadian public opinion, the role of the Confucian Institutes, um, the efforts in both academic and community groups uh, to both stifle anti-China expression and promote uh, supportive views. And so their efforts to try to manage that better. Uh, Canada has an Asia Pacific strategy, which focuses on partnerships, on economic ties, and on development assistance as ways, again, to solidify uh, Canada's relationships with other countries as a way of strengthening its, uh, its autonomy and its ability to act with regard to China and other issues. Recently, uh, Canada has adopted an Indo-Pacific nomenclature, uh, uh, Prime Minister Trudeau noted it in October, and this uh, might suggest a shift uh, to a greater emphasis on Japan and India, and also uh, greater collaboration with the US uh, position. Canada has also pursued collaboration with what, uh, for lack of a better term, is often referred to as like-minded countries. So we see uh, efforts to uh, stimulate the five eyes relationship, especially on technology uh, transfers, abuse and use. Uh, we see efforts to uh, collaborate more closely with the EU, with India, Japan. And I think there are some pretty impl important implications from the, uh, from the COP26 meetings uh, because China may seem more vulnerable and more isolated uh, because of its uh, non-appearance and therefore is particularly sensitive to collaboration among uh, multilateral groups and plurilateral groups, whether it's like-minded or otherwise. So that's uh, an important implication of the COPE meetings. And uh, my, my final point on this is uh, I was also asked to say a word or two about human rights. And I think it's uh, my approach at least, and I think uh, it's uncertain where Canada is going, but it's going farther and farther in this direction, is that human rights is a matter of treaty compliance. It's not a matter of saying our democratic system is better than China's authoritarian system or our norms are preferable. It's really about treaty, uh, treaty performance. And if we see China's performance under the UN uh, Convention on the Law of the Sea, especially the rejection of the Philippine arbitration decision, uh, China's performance regarding the uh, Convention on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination and its behavior in Xinjiang, China's performance under the Sino-UK uh, Sino uh, Declaration on Hong Kong, and China's performance on the WTO, uh, I think China's treaty performance, as I noted in a previous book, is, is quite uh, uh, um, uncertain and, and subject to uh, quite a bit of debate. And what becomes particularly interesting is China's repeated use of sovereignty claims to avoid uh, performance of treaty responsibilities. And I think as any first year international law student would remind us, uh, that is a uh, somewhat problematic position. But China's treaty performance has implications in other areas, trade, absolutely, as well as consular relations, as we saw in the Meng Wanzhou matter, uh, environmental cooperation, uh, health, and so on. So, so looking at human rights as a treaty compliance matter, I think is more productive. And I think uh, many in the Canadian policymaking process are, are, are embracing that view. It's a more productive approach than a normative competition. And then finally, it's improving the rule of law, which is uh, part of treaty performance, and, and it curbs the potential from what, for what uh, Julian Ku in a recent piece referred to as asymmetrical lawfare, which is that because China's legal system is uh, not as attentive to individual rights uh, and expressions and freedoms and so on as, as is the case in Canada, that the Canada uh, rule of law system as applied to Meng Wanzhou was a great deal more favorable and uh, and accommodating than was the case in uh, with the detention of the two Michaels. So those are some of the key kinds of questions in Canada's efforts to resist uh, China's uh, coercive diplomacy. A second major point for Canada is to enliven relations with the US. And we note the Wilson Center's report of earlier, uh, which talks about the White House roadmap on uh, renewing US-Canada partnership that talks about COVID cooperation, build back better, climate, diversity and inclusion, security and defense, global alliances, and those set a bit of a, a roadmap for or how things may proceed. Uh, there is some language in conf of confrontation with regard to China, and uh, it's all a matter of definitions, but I, I'm, uh, I, I think that is a, a, a nomenclature that many in Canada might emotionally like, but, uh, but intellectually it, it's uh, potentially problematic. Uh, there's cooperation on the issue of arbitrary detention. I mentioned the uh, Canadian sponsored declaration earlier, and also on the issues of Xinjiang and ge genocide and sanctions. There's a question about the 5G and Huawei matter. Um, Canada still has not made a decision on that, and, uh, and certainly coordination with the United States is a critical component in Canada's decision, so we'll see how that goes. Uh, China's Made in China 2025 program, which is uh, 
uh, by many accounts, a quite protectionist approach is a, a, a challenge for Canada and for the United States and, and offers potential for cooperation. So with Canada and the United States, as I've said in a recent piece, uh, the emphasis should be on the relational matter where we have coordination and collaboration and cooperation. And, uh, and that relational uh, connection with the United States is stronger and, uh, and, and we need to enliven it and continue it. Now, there are still, of course, some related Canada-US uh, issues, for example, trade and the Buy America uh, program on procurement and other things create some challenges for Canada. There are some existing trade sanction issues uh, out there, dairy, softwood, lumber, Canadian solar, which are matters of potential irritation. And then, of course, there's the uh, CPTPP, the uh, the, the recent uh, Canadian uh, Chinese application and the Taiwan application and the US membership question are all matters of critical importance to that uh, really important trade uh, relationship and Canada's role will be important. The second issue with the US is the AUKUS uh, relationship and, and what cat role Canada will play in that, particularly in light of the Five Eyes relationships and that remains to be seen. We'll see how that spins out. And then in terms of um, uh, Canada and the US, uh, Two other issues are critically important, of course, Taiwan and uh, Canada's had a trade office there since 86. Uh, there are currently discussions on a Foreign Investment Promotion Act with Taiwan and a proposed uh, uh, Ta uh, Canada-Taiwan Relations Framework Act. So uh, Canada is really uh, doing a lot to review its relations with Taiwan and see about making them more uh, robust. In Hong Kong, where there are 300,000 Canadians resident there and where the former uh, Canadian Chief Justice, uh, Madam Justice Beverly McLaughlin has just renewed her position at the Court of Final Appeals, Hong Kong is of course critically important to, uh, to Canada. And so along with Taiwan presents a range of questions, opportunities, and also challenges in coordinating uh, Canadian and US approaches. So the question is how does, how can the US and Canada work together and part of it's articulating common interests uh, part of it is to articulate principles of China engagement, and part of it is to resolve uh, bilateral differences, or at least not that let them get in the way of overall cooperation. The last point I'd like to make in this uh, a brief uh, presentation, and that is uh, to uh, the question of maintaining and restoring the Canada-China trade and investment relationship after Meng Wanzhou and COVID-19. Um, I think that uh, it's fair to say that China business uh, was in large part a Canadian effort at diversification away from dependence on the US economy. But now Canada is looking elsewhere to the Indo-Pacific, especially India and ASEAN, but also Latin America. But nonetheless, China uh, still looms large and the next panel will address these issues in greater detail. And, uh, and we, uh, we heard from, uh, uh, from uh, just recently from Anna Ashton about a number of these important issues. I would just say from the Canada side, Canada, China is Canada's second largest trading partner, although uh, former Foreign Minister Garneau noted in July that, that uh, it accounts for only 5% of Canada's total foreign trade lagging behind sales to the US and the European Union. So it's critically important, but it still has not displaced uh, the US in terms of a matter of diversification. Uh, in fact, Canada-China trade increased in 2021 so far over COVID-influenced 2020, and it's returning to close to 2018-2019 uh, levels, and we've seen that in the reporting by uh, the uh, Canada Trade, uh, China Trade Institute at the University of Alberta, and also the Asia Pacific Foundation, and on investment, uh, we've seen a fairly significant decline uh, uh, in uh, 219 uh, investment and, and subsequent over pre Meng Wanzhou uh, investments. So the investment effect on, on, on finance, on energy mining uh, has been uh, um, noticeable in the aftermath of Meng Wanzhou. There are a number of outstanding issues in the Canada-China business relationship. The first uh, would be of course the Meng Wanzhou disruptions, uh, restrictions placed by China on canola imports uh, pork and beef from Canada. There is, of course, the looming issue of Huawei and 5G. Um, uh, an additional question is the, the question about sanctions on Xinjiang produced goods, uh, in particular cotton and tomatoes, which are finding their way into the Canadian economy despite uh, public assurances of uh, a ban on imports from uh, Xinjiang. Uh, another issue is coal exports to, uh, to China after China's ban on Australian coal. And uh, that creates uh, a number of important opportunities for some major Canadian mining uh, firms. 
And speaking of mining, uh, the strategic minerals question is also critically important. It's a rare earth, uh, silicon, et cetera, access and extraction. And there's a recent takeover battle of a Canadian uh, mining company that has significant rare earth assets around the world. And it looks uh, at the moment where a Chinese bid has now been um, uh, challenged by a local Canadian bid, but those issues are gonna be ongoing. And of course, Canadian resources and strategic minerals are not inconsequential. Last point is Chinese export production uh, and supply chains uh, have been pretty severely disrupted due to China's zero COVID policies and due to energy shortages, especially aluminum and steel uh, to electricity heavy exports from China and emissions reductions with regard to coal fired power plants in China have also created challenges for its export production uh, framework. So those, those are a number of sort of ongoing issues in the Canada China business relationship that will need to be addressed. So I realize this has been brief and I apologize, uh, but uh, for if I, I don't think I've gone over yet, but anyway, uh, in summary, I would say that Canada-China relations are in a new phase after the Meng Wanzhou matter and affecting COVID where we have situational engagement rather than um, focus on, on maintaining a special relationship. Domestic politics in Canada and China loom large and are just critically important to understanding where things will go in the next little while. Um, uh, Canada's resistance of coercion, particularly the Declaration on Hostage Diplomacy, alliances, the rule of law, and treaty compliance are important components of Canadian policy initiative. And preserving collaboration with the US and with other allies is uh, critically important. Uh, Canada, I think it's fair to say, is a more multilaterally oriented foreign policy than many other countries, and, uh, and this will continue. And then finally, uh, maintaining and restoring that business relationship. So th some of those are some of the critical issues facing Canada at this uh, uh, very uh, transformative time that we are in at the moment. Uh, thank you very much, and I hope I didn't go over. Thank you very much, uh, Pittman, for that uh, uh, tour d'horizon. Tour de uh, you've raised a lot of issues, uh, as has Anna. Uh, both on the global geopolitical front and also on the narrower uh, set of issues concerning supply chains. Of course, we're, we're talking about supply chains uh, at this experts uh, meeting. Um, and I wanted to know, first of all, before I get to some of the questions from our participants, whether Anna had anything that she wanted to say in, in response to, uh, to Pittman uh, and his, his overview. I think that was a great overview, Pittman. Um, and I think many of the issues you raised that uh, that relate to supply chains, from Uyghur forced labor to um, you know the role of U.S. coal in China's energy environment uh, versus versus Australian coal because of China's approach to international relations these days. Um, they are. They're very complex ones to solve, as I'm sure everyone tuned into this is aware. And one of the, the concerning things that we're seeing uh, is that in Congress, a lot of the proposals um, are sort of the proposals to uh, move, force movement of supply chains out of China and the proposals to try to get companies to um, diversify and create redundancies in their supply chains uh, while certainly understandable in terms of their rationale, are getting out ahead of um, efforts also in Congress and by the administration to encourage industry in the United States to be built, the capacity to be expanded. Um, and there's, there's a little bit of concern on our part that we will lose access to the China market for a whole variety of things long before we actually have capacity or um, alternatives in place um, to, to mitigate the damage of, of losing that access. So one example is in the semiconductor arena. You know, we've got proposals in Congress uh, and from the Biden administration that would devote $52 billion to trying to beef up our ability to produce semiconductor chips here in the United States and, and also other high-tech goods um, and to conduct more research and development in those areas. But $52 billion isn't gonna get us a very long way when you think about that in the context of our reliance on, um, on Taiwan for semiconductors. Um, just what, what Taiwan produces in a month so 
so completely surpasses what we can currently produce in a month with the foundry that we have in New York State that it's just kind of stunning. And um, experts on this issue have said that $52 billion is a nice start for building up a US domestic industry in this space, but we'd need 10 times that to replicate what TSMC is doing in Taiwan. No, and on top of that, it would take us years to build these boundaries, even if Congress approved all of, all of the money overnight. Um, and then, you know, similarly on the, on the Uyghur forced labor issue, we've got uh, legislation moving forward pretty quickly that uh, we are confident will pass this year or next year um, that is going to significantly disrupt supply chains um, for a variety of industries, not because those industries actually rely on Xinjiang as a source uh, for, for most of the goods that they're producing or importing, uh, with the exception of, of cotton, which is a little bit tricky, but because um, they can't, the, the companies would have to somehow prove a negative, show that they don't have any, any relationship to Xinjiang or, or Uyghur workers elsewhere in China, anywhere elsewhere in China who may be um, forced into their labor situations. And that's, that's an almost impossible proof to, level of proof to meet. Uh, so you know, we, don't have, we don't have alternatives in place and yet we're facing imminent draconian um, measures that are going to really disrupt uh, supply chains for not just critical goods, but also uh, basic ones. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Anna. Uh, a question has come in. I think you, Anna, have, have answered it, um, but I'd like to give you an opportunity to respond, and, and Pittman as well. I think you both addressed this issue, but the question is related to decoupling uh, supply chains uh, from uh, China. How difficult would it be to achieve this? What are the uh, short-term uh, and longer-term uh, negative implications uh, for the economy of taking such action? I think you both address these uh, issues, um, and we don't need to, to re repeat the comments you've already made, but what interests me is the apparent lack of Canada and US collaboration, and I mean collaboration in, in the context of the Biden-Trudeau roadmap, collaboration, cooperation on strategic minerals on, uh, in that area. It seems to me that there hasn't been much done on that front. And that relates to controlling investment, dealing with security issues on a more, uh, Cooperative, collaborative, bilateral basis. So, what would your what would your comments be on 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 those points? Well, I would agree um, that there hasn't been enough done on that front, uh, not only between the U.S. and Canada, but uh, by the U.S. in thinking about what relationships it needs to cement even more broadly than Canada um, in order to ensure that we have adequate supply. So uh, an interesting example is uh, lithium. CPTPP includes both Australia and Chile, which are two of the biggest sources of lithium in the world. China has applied to join CPTPP. The United States backed out of it and, and has yet to indicate whether or not uh, we plan to, to pursue re-engagement there. Um, it's a problem. Uh, well, I agree. It's a it's a problem, and I think uh, it does, you know, it does boil back to a kind of a fundamental uh, policy orientation question about the question of industrial policy. I mean, uh, you know, there is no shortage of uh, of economic experts who will tell us uh, the government should not be in the business of picking winners and losers, and we hear that discourse in Canada, and we certainly hear it in the United States, and and so the question then becomes, well. OK, maybe we have a general consensus, and I think it's debatable whether we do have that consensus. But nonetheless, even if you presume there is that consensus on uh, being careful about industrial policy, maybe you carve out exceptions for issues of strategic importance. But then the question is a definitional one of where the boundaries between strategically important uh, industrial policy and general industrial policy and so on, and the inability to reach consensus just even on the process of how to 
forge that forward is, is a critical uh, a critical one. You know, one of the uh, points that uh, I think is also worth bearing in mind in terms of the uh, points that Adam made just a minute ago about, about uh, market access is uh, on the coal side, for example, and other uh, strategic minerals will be included in that, but, but some of the COP26 uh, declarations are gonna have a big impact on that, even if they're not regulatorily binding, they are certainly gonna have an impact on public perception, on political perception and so on. So, so those are some of the uh, important uh, issues coming out of that. And then as has been evident in the Xinjiang forced labor question, it's the sub suppliers. I mean, you know, it's not the, you know, the, you can, in Canada, for example, I think we've got fairly strong uh, confidence that uh, uh, textile companies in, in uh, Canada are not willfully importing cotton produced with forced uh, Uyghur labor in Xinjiang. But at the same time, they can't control their sub suppliers. And that's what the supply chain difficulty is all about. And micromanaging that supply chain is, well, it's both uh, practically difficult, but it's also legally potentially problematic. Um, and, and having spent a fair amount of time in Xinjiang over the last, uh, I stopped going about eight years ago, uh, I did an earlier book on Xinjiang policy and, and paying visits to the uh, uh, cotton farms and to the tomato factories that are run by the Bing Tuan, by the, uh, by basically PLA uh, associated production arm. And so, uh, and you see very clearly there, even before all of the detention camps and so on, a fairly, uh, uh, rigorous uh, controlling and some would say abusive labor situation, even aside from the detention camps issue. So, so, but it's controlling the sub suppliers and monitoring them that makes the control of the overall supply chain more difficult. Um, uh, coming back to the point of Canada US collaboration and cooperation on these issues, and I want to address. Uh, Pittman's point about uh, human rights uh, in, uh, in Xinjiang. Um, in the context of the Canada-US-Mexico trade agreement, we call it uh, Kuzma, uh, and uh, in the US it's called the USMCA. Uh, the Canada and the US have agreed on a way to monitor the flow of aluminum and steel through Canada, dumped aluminum and steel, if you want to put it that way, through Canada to the United States. There's a bilateral process. John Layton was very much involved in putting together that bilateral process where the two countries would monitor the flow of those products to ensure that Canada is not a country of transit to get into the United States market uh, with dumped or subsidized, particularly subsidized aluminum and steel. I haven't seen anything about Canada and the United States collaborating on supply chain issues regarding cotton or uh, other products coming from Xinjiang that are um, uh, allegedly the result of human rights abuses. Isn't there something that could be done in that area uh, to uh, allow the, both countries to jointly monitor the process of importing through supply chains of those kinds of products made uh, with uh, abuse of human rights policies in China? Uh, well, maybe I can take a start on that. I, I think uh, one of the major differences between monitoring uh, aluminum and steel flows to determine rules of origin and avoid uh, um, um, uh, conditions of transit problems where that you mentioned um, is that the question of dumping and subsidies is a matter that is codified in international treaties. This is an international treaty question. And so if uh, China is the target of that, there are measures that China can take under the WTO um, that where it can represent its interests. And as you uh, undoubtedly know, China has a, a very well-developed uh, regulatory framework for responding to WTO complaints by other trading partners. But the difference with that and Xinjiang is China does not consider the Xinjiang matter to be a matter of treaty compliance. They consider it to be a totally internal matter, which is dependent on Chinese sovereignty. Now, I might debate that issue because I think China has signed and ratified a number of international human rights treaties, including the, uh, the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Racial Discrimination mm -hmm. that I mentioned earlier, the CERN yeah. Treaty, as well as various specific human rights treaties. So we can make the argument, at least, and some have, that, that China's behavior in Xinjiang is in violation of its treaty obligations. But because China does not 
accept that position. And China does not even admit that the issues are going on using a WTO framework like uh, um, uh, uh, transit questions and, and rules of origin. It's a bit more difficult because it becomes more unilateral and then China is in a situation of not actually being part of the legal process that is being used, and and so it, it is more difficult. But I, you know, I think I think these are very important questions for governments to deal with because they involve both moral and practical implications. Sorry. Yeah, I, I think um, although China doesn't see this as as a treaty issue, um, Pittman and I are in agreement that there there are international agreements out there that mm -hmm. should apply. Um, one of them that we've really focused on uh, is the UN Guiding Principles on Business and Human Rights. Um, and then of course there are uh, international labor organization principles. Um, and I think certainly Canada and the United States could work to um, together at the UN to push for a greater emphasis on those principles and uh, remind China that it, it has signed on to those principles too. Um, and I think sort of zooming out uh, to an even more macro view, this is an area where um, China is, as Pittman said, pushing within international organizations to sort of redefine or um, alter rules and norms that have existed for a long time. Um, and, and one of one of the things that it's pushing on is the definition, the common understanding of what, what human rights are. Um, from China's perspective, it is uh, human rights are about meeting basic needs, shelter, food, um, security. And from, from a Western perspective, human rights go much further than that. Um, and individual liberty is an important piece. And I think um, the U.S. and Canada, to the extent that uh, we're able to cooperate in, in ensuring that we are um, bolstering the accepted longstanding view of what constitutes human rights and pushing back against a narrower, uh, more basic view of human rights that doesn't include um, some of the things that we think are critical, um, that is another area where we should be working together. Uh, I think, can I, yeah, cool. can I just add one, one final note on that? And that is that I, I did a lengthy report for the Asia Pacific Foundation about four years ago, five years ago, I guess it's now, on the integration of human rights and business. And that contains a number of points that, that uh, Anna just made. But the other thing I would say is that this distinction between the positive rights, which are rights to health and housing and so on, and the negative rights, which is rights insulation from government interference, China has not, uh, there, there are problems in China on actually both sides of that equation, but that is not an either or set of choices in international human rights law, because international human rights law makes it very clear there is no hierarchy and you don't you don't pick one or the other, they're all interdependent and then, you know, indivisible and so on. So, so I think it's a, there's a normative question here that is at the root of the ability to reach some kind of consensus or at least a agreement, even an agreement to disagree on these points. And they have a big impact on the perception of China and a big impact on and the reality of China, but also a big impact on how we manage that relationship going forward. It also seems to me that, um, picking up on the points that both of you have made, uh, there still is room for much more cooperation, collaboration, working together between Canada and the United States on a lot of these issues, both treaty related and, and non-treaty or soft law related dealing with, for example, UN declarations uh, that China has signed on to respecting uh, human rights. Um, I'll give you an example. And it goes a little bit beyond the supply chain issue, but for example, in the case of the two Michaels, now our American friends may have some knowledge of, of that issue. There was no doubt that China was in breach of its obligations under the Vienna Convention on Consular Relations. There was no doubt about that. And I think that's an area where Canada and the United States could kind of form a, a, a joint effort to ensure that China meets its treaty obligations in that regard. In respect, again, forgive me for going beyond supply chain issues, but in respect of the South China Sea, there's no doubt 
that China's position with respect to uh, the enlargement of coral reefs in the South China Sea, which by the way, is very far removed from the Chinese mainland and the Chinese territorial sea. On that issue and on transit rights through the China, through the Taiwan Strait, uh, China's declarations and claims about uh, uh, aggressive actions by the US and Canada, by the way, we sent a frigate through there recently. Uh, there's no doubt that that is beyond beyond uh, uh, any, any merit in terms of uh, um, the law of the sea convention and customer international law involving transit rights. Those are areas where Canada and the United States have common interests, notwithstanding the fact that Canada is a small player, US is a global force. And on coming back to supply chains, I still think that there is much more room for joint efforts on the part of our two countries uh, even with the economic and geopolitical imbalance in the relationships. Uh, and we, th we could do more in, in, in that regard. Um, those are just my comments, but I wondered if either Anna or Pittman had anything to say about that. Well, in, in again, in my uh, current book, um, I have a list of 10 recommendations at the end on how to deal with this. And I, I you know, I, as with many times with myself in China, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, uh, I have the experience of being not this conference, but another conference very recently within the period of a week called the China Basher and a Panda Hugger in the same conference. And so I'm, <laughs> I'm sort of comfortable with being kind of in the middle. But in my recommendations, there's a lot of language on encouraging China, inviting China and so on. But one of the uh, uh, points is to invite China to acknowledge the limits of its sovereign authority to reinterpret international human rights law. And that would involve cooperation with the International Law Commission mm. to, uh, to, to really reach a a consensus on what sovereignty in the international system means. And, and it is interesting that in the uh, China approach to human rights, they are very, they, they cite the UN Charter and the uh, Universal Declaration of Human Rights more frequently than other things. And those are two documents, especially the Charter, that really entrench the question of state sovereignty. And China has embraced that and used it as a way of defending against uh, human rights criticisms. But as you suggest, whether it's on human rights or law of the sea or any number of other things, um, they are bound by treaty commitments. And, and even for treaties that they have signed but not ratified, like the International Convention on Civil and Political Rights, they are bound by the, under the convention, the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties, which they have signed and ratified, not to take any steps that would frustrate the purpose of the treaty. Right. So, so, you know, it doesn't really matter whether they signed them or ratified them, they're still bound to honor the principles in them, if not enforce them directly. So I think that that approach, I, I do think, and having worked with a number of treaty people in, in the Chinese government, fairly senior levels of Chinese government, and also academics at quite senior levels, um, there is a consensus within some quarters that China's international interests are supported by treaty requirements and so on. And again, they never hesitate to cite treaties when it uh, suits them. So I think, you know, returning to that question of rule of law, treaty compliance, and what that actually means for sovereignty is a discussion that really needs to happen. And unfortunately, and I say this with a great respect for, um, for, the, uh, for the country of my birth, the United States and its community, the United States as a, as a big country, and sometimes it's not as fulsomely uh, wedded to international law principles of multilateralism and deference as we might hope for. So, so that's part of the difficulty in, in uh, being a source of criticism of China because then the what about arguments prolifer uh, prol proliferate and, and just muddy the waters. Anna. I would just add that, um, you know, China's, China's behaviors within international institutions and on the world stage trying to sort of redefine some of our rules and norms um, are not new behaviors. And China's been uh, pursuing its own vision of what the rules and norms should be, I think, for a long time, not just, not just in international fora, but also um, within, domestic, um, within domestic legal systems all around the world when its, when its interests are challenged in, in courts of law in the United States and in many other countries, uh, they've they've mounted defenses where they're pushing their own interpretations of U.S. laws, Canadian laws, and uh, European laws. So um, none of that's new, and I think to some extent we kind of have to get used to it because China is an enormous 
economy and empower on the world stage these days. And it is only natural that they are going to want to assert their views of how things should work. On the other hand, um, there are real questions about whether or not their views are compatible with the way that things have worked and the way that, that the United States, Canada, and other countries uh, want and need things to work for our best interests. Um, and that's, I think, why we're seeing such a focus on supply chain challenges and such pressure to um, sort of um, detach supply chains from China. You know, there's so many drivers there, national security drivers, human rights drivers, health and safety and critical goods, tech comp competitiveness and critical goods and on and on. So we're, we're seeing uh, lots of reasons being pushed forward for, um, for supply chains to be changed and moved away from China. But at the same time, uh, both US and Canadian companies um, and by extension, our economies are uh, heavily wedded to the Chinese economy. And a lot of, a lot of our companies are um, operating in China for China, right? Their, their supply chains um, that come back to the United States and Canada are not necessarily that dependent on China, um, but they have operations in China that allow them to access the Chinese market, which in turn um, is critical for their, their global revenue and their ability to, to put revenue back into research and development that makes them strong global players and helps our economies to be uh, cutting edge economies, right? Uh, so I think uh, one of the things that the US and Canada can do together is focus on the need for redundancy in supply chains, especially redundancy in the Western hemisphere, because one of the things that COVID really brought home was, um, you know, in a pinch, it would be good to have to have some uh, extra supply chains that are, that are closer to home. Um, rather than on the other side of the world. But that doesn't necessarily mean that we need to be advocating or working together to um, completely get rid of supply chain connections to China. I think um, we actually need to be doing what we can to, to continue to keep that market open for our companies um, for our own economic well-being. Very good. I, I, I think we're getting close to our time limit, but I, I wanted to know from Ted Perrin how we're doing. Have we got time for uh, a final exchange? Ted? Yes, Larry, you've got uh, just about uh, 10 more minutes to go. So okay. you do have some time for some further discussion. Okay. Uh, well, there, there's a, a couple of uh, points that have come in uh, from, uh, from our participants. Um, one is whether um, Canada uh, has been pursuing or should pursue a more conciliatory approach to China, given our different strategic and economic interests, uh, then perhaps the U.S. is prepared to pursue. Um, I'm not sure that as a result of, uh, I'm, I'm sort of answering the question, but I want, I want you, to you two to respond. I'm not so sure that given the change in public opinion, which translates into political imperative, uh, that Canada is now prepared to be more conciliatory towards China. I, I think, and Pittman has referred to this previously, there has been a hardening of attitudes towards China uh, among Canadians generally. Maybe not uh, to the extent it has reached uh, those proportions in the United States, but I'm not sure that uh, Canadian politics and Canadian diplomacy will pivot towards uh, a more conciliatory approach, uh, given the experience of the two Michaels being held hostage and the Meng Wanzhou uh, affair. But I wanted to know whether you, you each think that uh, Canada uh, is being or should be more conciliatory, given our uh, political and economic position, and to some extent, our our dependency on Chinese supply chains, perhaps greater than the United States. So, what are your what are your comments, uh, Anna? I'll go to you first, and then to Pittman. Well, I think that that you're touching on a critical point when it comes to uh, the Biden administration's desire to make multilateral engagement and coalition building 
a major part of its China strategy, which is uh, the United States, if it uh, approaches these problems unilaterally, is going to find itself in a situation uh, where countries like Canada, Australia, and many, many others that uh, have, have close and important ties to China economically um, sort of fill the, the void that the US creates. Um, whether or not, I think, of course, Canada may have hardening attitudes towards China, but, but the economic realities um, remain. And so the United States uh, needs to make it worth Canada's while to work together and adopt you know, similar approaches. Um, and we also need to bring other nations into, into that effort. Edmund. Uh, thank you. Well, again, you know, the devil's in the detail, so to speak. And the question is, what does conciliation mean? And, and part of the difficulty uh, with, uh, with the Canada-China relationship is that uh, Canada has learned that being conciliatory and friendly doesn't actually help you when uh, China decides to detain the two Michaels in retaliation for the Meng Wanzhou legal extradition question. And so um, that the question of conciliation is, you know, the question is, what does it mean? And, and that's one of the reasons why I have proposed, and, and I think some are taking this up, which is to say that uh, rather than looking at an overall relationship that we want all things to go well and, and we will adopt whatever conciliation or other attitudes toward tensions that we have to in order to preserve the overall relationship, I think that there is a greater acceptance now that there are areas where China and Canada just have conflicts. And the Meng Wanzhou matter is just one example of those. But those should not deter us from seeking cooperation on things like COVID response, on things like climate and so on. Unfortunately, the Chinese have been quite resistant to that idea. But nonetheless, I think, uh, I think a continued pressing for collaboration in areas where we have mutual interests and a willingness to kind of compartmentalize uh, mm -hmm. areas where we have conflict is, is an approach to a manageable relationship. You know, uh, I, I think um, uh, that, that's how I would look at, uh, at conciliation is moving toward a more situational approach that allows us to cooperate on issues where cooperation is appropriate and where we have mutual interests, but not um, giving up our concerns about Chinese behavior that affects Canadians, whether it's in Canada or in Hong Kong or elsewhere. Yes, good, good points. Well, I know we are getting close to our timelines, but what I wanted to ask each of you to comment on is where should the Canada-US Law Institute take this program further? How do we take it further? I mean, this has been, I think, a very, very useful, informative uh, discussion. I think we need to do some more uh, digging into this issue and some, have some more discussion. But we're really talking about how government policies in our two countries can work together uh, uh, on dealing with China in both a broad global uh, a macro sense and uh, in terms of supply chains. So what, what would you think we should do as Kuzli uh, in um, developing this, this issue in our programs? Anna, what do you think? You're new to Kuzli and Pittman is as well. We're so happy to have you here, but we wanted to know what your reaction is to the idea that maybe there's something that the Canada US Law Institute can do, can do in furthering this discussion. I, I would regret if we just moved on to other things and didn't carry this the, and all the good ideas you presented forward in some way. Well, I certainly think that supply chain cooperation um, is, is something that has the potential for broad appeal, at least to uh, US government officials. Um, and you know, in areas like, I, I think it would be useful for Kuzli to have um, more discussions on uh, specific supply chain issues, for example, critical minerals and rare earths. Um, what, are the, what are the differences in our laws when it comes to the environmental regulations that make it possible or, or difficult to, um, to create our own rare earths mining and processing industry um, in, in either country? And how can we potentially align our our legal regimes to effectively bring that industry online so that we have a Western Hemisphere supply chain. 
Thank you. Uh, Pittman, you, you, I think, will have the final word. Uh, well, I would just take uh, that maybe a step farther and, and to say uh, it's a terrific approach and uh, pretty much the same what I was doing. I, I think what would be very helpful is to develop, and I'm sorry to get bureaucratic about it, but develop a matrix that, are, that, that expresses and clarifies the Canadian policy and law perspective and the US policy and law perspective on a range of critical issues regarding China. And I can, you know, we've talked about probably 20 of them this morning. Yeah. Yeah. So you could list all of those and then in a column have the, the US and the Canadian differences and similarities. And that would allow us to have some level of benchmarking of kind of where we are and gives us a kind of a route forward. So if we identify supply chains or we, we identify uh, technology uh, uh, imports or technology licensing, or if we uh, identify um, ocean uh, uh, minerals and, uh, and ocean security or those kinds of issues, many of them, um, then we can get a, a very clear and concise and easily accessible uh, matrix of where the similarities and differences are. And then those set the stage for future uh, basically research and policy initiatives. Now, I see that as a terrific project for law students, both uh, in Canada and the United States. And that's part of what we're all about is bringing the academic institutions uh, together in common projects. So our time now is up, and I wanted to thank both Anna Ashton and Pittman Potter for their excellent, informative, articulate, and pertinent presentations. Uh, we're very grateful to both of you for taking the time to be with us uh, today, and, and we thank you uh, very much. And uh, with that, thanks. You would hear applause if you were actually in the room with us. Um, I'm going to turn it back to uh, Ted uh, to take us to the next uh, panel uh, in our uh, discussions today. So thank you both. Thank you very much and good luck with the rest of the session. Thank you. Okay, welcome back everyone. Um, after a short break uh, from our last panel, uh, which was excellent. So thank you to uh, all three of the experts who are involved there. Uh, I We now present a the next panel looking at the private sector dimensions. Uh, so the view from North American, Canadian and US uh, businesses uh, on the issues of supply chain, China and some of the disruptions that have been going on. So chairing our panel is uh, James Graham. Uh, he's on our Coosley Executive Committee, a longstanding supporter of Coosley. Uh, and his, uh, his corporation, Cleveland Cliffs, has also been a long supporter of Case Western School of Law and, uh, and our programming here at Coosley. So James, we thank you very much for your support, your time here today. I'll turn it over to you now. Thanks, Ted. Really happy to be here and uh, appreciate everybody's uh, participation, especially those that helped um, organize this event. So I am uh, pleased to introduce uh, the two members of uh, the panel that I'm moderating. Uh, the first is uh, the Honorable Perrin Beatty. Uh, he is the president and CEO of the Canadian Chamber of Commerce, representing 200,000 members in Canada's largest uh, national business association. Perrin is the principal spokesperson for the organization advocating positions of its membership to the federal government, international organizations, media, and the general public. Prior to joining the, the Canadian Chamber in 2007, Perrin was the president and CEO of the Canadian Manufacturers and Ex Exporters. I'm also um, pleased to introduce Mr. Kevin Dempsey, Kevin is the president and CEO of the American Iron and Steel Institute, or AISI, which represents the interests of American steel producers. Prior to assuming the role of president and CEO, Kevin was the senior vice president of public policy and general counsel to AISI for 11 years during which time he was instrumental in key policy successes, including the implementation of the Section 232 trade remedies to preserve the steel industry's key role in national and economic security in the US 
uh, strengthen trade laws and other measures to enhance the steel manufacturing competitiveness um, in the US. I want to take just a minute before we uh, jump in uh, to the panel to provide a little bit of background on uh, myself and, and Cleveland Cliffs and why this topic is important um, uh, to the company that employs me. Uh, Cleveland Cliffs is the largest flat rolling, uh, rolled steel producer in North America. We were founded in 1847, so we're going to have our 175th anniversary next year. We were founded as a mine operator, um, operating both um, in the US and, Can and Canada over the years. Um, we are the largest uh, manufacturer of iron ore pellets in North America, a way to um, keep steel making as clean as possible. The company uh, grew into the steel sector in the midst of the pandemic last year with the acquisition of AK Steel in March of 2020 and the acquisition of ArcelorMittal USA in December of 2020. We've gone uh, from 2019 revenues of uh, $2 billion to projected revenues of this year of $21 billion. The company is uh, considered a vertically integrated uh, operation. So we mine raw materials, uh, we do direct reduction of iron uh, to primary steel making and downstream finishing. Um, and so we're sort of self-sufficient, but the problem with supply chain that we've encountered um, during the pandemic and, and, uh, and including this year is that our customers are having supply chain issues um, more so than we are. So um, uh, especially the shortages of uh, microchips for the auto manufacturers. Cliffs, uh, Cleveland Cliffs is by far the largest uh, supplier of flat rolled steel to the automotive industry. And uh, this supply, supply chain issue has really negatively impacted um, the volume of steel that we sell to uh, customers in, in the US. So that's a little bit of why supply chain is an important issue to, um, to, to me uh, personally as uh, the EVP and CLO of, of Cliffs. So with that, I wanted to offer up an opportunity um, for Perrin, if you have any prepared uh, opening remarks, otherwise we can jump right into a few um, questions to start things off. Great, James, thank you. Thank you very much. I do have some prepared remarks and uh, I'll try to get through them fairly quickly. I'll look forward to the discussion. Thank you, first of all, for the invitation to be here. Um, as you mentioned, the Canadian Chamber is Canada's largest business association. And the issues that you're talking about today are ones that are very important to us. I want to particularly focus on the uh, issue of China. And many in recent years, the bilateral relationship between Canada and China has been particularly fraught. The recent conclusion of the extradition case against Meng Wanzhou and the subsequent release of Canadian citizens Michael Kovrig and Michael Spavor, who are being held hostage by the Chinese, remove a major impediment in the bilateral relationship. However, tensions are still high. The challenges in building a more productive relationship are complex and they're multifaceted. First, the reality is that China under Xi Jinping has simply become a more assertive and abrasive global power. The Chinese government's escalating territorial aggression in its neighboring regions, coercive style of international diplomacy, and clampdown on domestic dissidents have deepened geopolitical tensions and strained relationship between China and Western nations. We've, we have seen in Canada, Beijing's willingness to link political and economic issues. For example, in recent times, exports of agriculture products like canola and meat were shut out of the market for political reasons. Our colleagues in Australia have seen a very similar dynamic with some of their uh, key exports. I don't have to tell you that China is sui generis among the world's nations. It's not an enemy, but nor is it an ally. It's a key player in the international community, but it doesn't play by the community's rules. It fiercely resists uh, interference in matters that it considers to be its own affairs, 
but it has no hesitation in interfering in the affairs of others. The adverse global consequences would be enormous if it were to succeed and equally enormous if it were to fail. And we should not embrace the regime in Beijing, but we must engage with it to resolve global problems. The challenge for businesses in Western countries like Canada and uh, to an even greater degree, Australia, is that China is too large a market to ignore. Getting shut out of the Chinese market would have a serious impact on businesses in important sectors, and there will be no shortage of other players seeking to fill the gap. Well, it can be difficult at times to neatly classify the views of members in an association as large as ours is. It's fair to place the views of the Canadian Chamber members towards China in three general categories. The first category is those companies currently doing business in the Chinese market or that hope to do so. The second category are members in the middle. These are companies that may do business in China and find it a worthwhile endeavor, but that could be competing against Canadian companies in third country, against Chinese companies in third country markets like Africa or Latin America. And the third is members facing direct and often unfair competition within the Canadian market from Chinese companies particularly in our industrial and manufacturing sectors. Now, all of this is complicated by another major factor, the COVID-19 pandemic, which has exposed significant vulnerabilities in the global trade status quo. Work by Statistics Canada and the Canadian Chamber of Commerce through the Canadian Survey on Business Conditions found that nearly 80% of surveyed Canadian companies had experienced some disruption to their supply chains following the start of the pandemic. Additionally, just over half of the respondents reported an inability to move goods because of these disruptions. Widespread shortages of goods following from these disruptions have also exposed our, our dependence on foreign producers like China for supplies that are critical to our national security and our industrial competitiveness. At the height of the pandemic, this was most acutely apparent in global shortages in personal protective equipment and other necessary medical supplies. Frankly, it was a dogfight to secure those resources as various countries' transport aircraft sat on the tarmacs of Chinese airports, waiting and hoping for a truck, for a truck of N95 masks to arrive. More diversified sources of these products could have avoided those challenges in the early days of the, of the pandemic. Now, additionally, international coverage of forced labor in China has also brought a renewed focus on human rights and labor conditions in the country and on supply chains that include Chinese inputs. As a result of USMCA, Canada banned the importation of goods made with forced labor last year. Now this was a fairly large leap for Canadian customs policy and we're seeing increased pressure for the government to use these powers to interdict shipments. As recent media coverage has pointed out, no shipments have been stopped by the Canadian Border Services Agency on the suspicion that they contain products made with forced labor as yet. Now, more specifically, there's been increased scrutiny regarding various tomato-based products that may be being produced with forced labor. Although, government, although China remains a major player in global trade, recent supply chain disruptions, coupled with already contentious diplomatic relations, have forced governments and businesses alike to begin to reassess their reliance on manufacturing in China. Our governments urgently need to address these supply chain vulnerabilities. As many have already discussed, this new reality requires that governments and businesses recalibrate their policies in a wide array of areas. When it comes to supply chains, it's now clear that prioritizing efficiency over all else is no longer feasible. Supply chains must also be resilient and sustainable now, however, it's also true that governments are generally ill-equipped to manage the many intricacies of modern globalized supply chains. We're seeing this at the moment with the crisis and the rising cost of shipping. Despite the problem growing, governments have not been able to do demonstrably make a difference. The private sector working in collaboration with government can and must lead in the post-pandemic economic recovery that will require strengthening our supply chains. Over the course of the pandemic, we've seen how businesses have risen to meet this challenge. They've also rapidly adapted to operate and serve the public in this new environment, 
They've retooled to provide medical equipment while preserving jobs. They've innovated to produce life-saving vaccines. Business is already laying the groundwork for our post-pandemic recovery. For the economy to recover fully, the private sector must be fully engaged. Government initiatives to promote diversification of international supply chains must be oriented towards fostering connections between businesses and our, tree, and our key trading partners. Now, given that the already highly integrated nature of our, of our cross-border supply chains is so real, Canadian and American businesses are, are already well-placed to turn to each other for inputs. These new conditions should encourage us to strengthen the Canada-United States private sector collaboration. Building trade security and resiliency is vital for Canadians and Americans alike. Because of our shared geography, values, and security interests, Canada and the United States have a mutual interest in a strong defense industrial base that meets the realities of the current security environment. I'd like to end my remarks by touching on just a few specific areas. Let me start with critical minerals. Natural Resources Canada reports that China produces more than 60% of the rare earth elements within the critical minerals family. The Congressional Research Service states that from 2015 to 2018, the United States imported 80% of its rare earths from China. The impacts of supply disruptions have been noticeable. For example, when China ceased exports of rare earths to Japan for 59 days, prices increased between 60 and 350%. The Biden administration's recent supply chain review identified over 20 critical mineral products where Canada can play a role meeting American defense needs. By sourcing critical minerals from within North America, businesses can enhance the resiliency of critical mineral supply chains on the continent. And there are two specific tools to consider. First, government purchases of equipment for defense and security can fall within the broad application of national security exclusions to show preferences for certain firms. As a result, Canada should explore with the US how government procurement contracts can be leveraged by building, by building in requirements for North American sourced critical materials. For example, when possible, critical minerals and defense products should be required to be sourced from North America. Where imports are not sourced from North America, strict certification requirements uh, should be made to ensure critical minerals are not produced with forced labor as a precondition for securing government contracts. And second, Canada should coordinate with the United States on stockpiling of critical minerals. Let me touch briefly on distortive industrial subsidies. Both Canadian and American companies are facing similar challenges from Chinese companies that compete on non-market terms. This includes when competing for business in third, third country markets, as well as imports coming into our countries. My members constantly tell me that they're ready to compete, but they can't do it with one hand behind their back since they have to operate according to market conditions. Canada and the United States need to take a two-pronged approach to the issue. One of those tools is continuing to pursue trade disciplines that limit the use of these distortive industrial subsidies. Uh, Canada and the United States should also continue to look at their rules for the anti-dumping system to ensure that we share information on best practices to support a balanced enforcement regime by both countries. Finally, on a more strategic level, I want to mention the importance of working with allies. It's not just about Canada and the United States trying to do this on our own. There's a critical need to work with others and particularly with the other industrialized democracies. This includes leveraging forums like the G7 and the OECD where more like-minded countries can caucus and develop common approaches. While American interests have not changed, we at least now have a president who's notionally more willing to engage with allies. We should also be taking another look at the CPTPP. The CPTPP came out with a bang, but it's now at an inflection point given the focus on expansion. The United Kingdom, Taiwan, and China have all formally applied to undertake the accession process. The Canadian Chamber position is that any applicant able to meet the high standards of the agreement 
should be considered, but that standards shouldn't be watered down for those who can't. Now, I understand that CPTPP remains anathema to many in Washington, but I also know that a decision by the United States to seek to rejoin the agreement would send an important and welcome signal of its desire to support integrated supply chains amongst like-minded countries. It would also send a message that the US understands the importance of a rules-based international trade system. Now, I wanna be very clear on this point. However much other countries may like to criticize the United States from time to time, the world needs it to be successful and the world needs it to lead. Without American engagement and leadership, our global economy, human rights, international security, and democracy itself are all at risk. Officials in Ottawa, Washington, Canberra, Tokyo, and elsewhere amongst the CPTPP membership should look at how US reentry can be facilitated. Well, while the pressing issues we face undoubtedly pose many obstacles for businesses to navigate, there are also substantial opportunities. Governments play a critical role in setting the conditions within which the private sector operates. In North America, we can't afford to be complacent given the rise of China and the fundamental reorientation that it's seeking in the geopolitical system. Thank you very much for the opportunity to present a Canadian business perspective, and I look forward to our discussion. Thanks, Baron. Appreciate your, uh, your remarks. Um, Kevin, do you want to jump in at this point or go right into questions? Uh, thanks, James. Uh, uh, let me let me just uh, make a couple of comments in response to parents. I, I think there was uh, a great deal in what, uh, what what we just heard that, that the U.S. side, uh, from an industry perspective, would agree with. Um, you know, we we I've seen we see the same challenges in terms of uh, uh, our supply chains uh, and and especially the weaknesses in those international supply chains that have been exposed by COVID nineteen. And China, in particular, presents uh, some some real challenges for us. Uh, you know, my background is in, in the steel industry with the American Iron and Steel Institute. We're uh, representing U.S. steel, iron ore, and steel producers in the U.S. We work closely with our colleagues in Canada and Mexico through uh, various uh, uh, fora, both uh, with just within North America as well as more globally through the OECD Steel Committee. And in that uh, framework, I think we do see, in particular, um, some real challenges coming from China because of the uh, great reliance in the Chinese economic system on government industrial policy, often tied with a, a heavy uh, focus on large state-owned enterprises. And that has presented uh, a number of challenges that, uh, that I think have um, have created some some problems for us in the in the global trading system. Certainly in steel, one aspect of that is it has it has led to um, a large global overcapacity problem in steel. This is actually something not unique to steel. I know it's based in aluminum and a number of other sectors, but uh, that has uh, that has over overhung the uh, global uh, supply chain for uh, goods made that that rely on steel as a key input. And uh, has led to a number of problems, uh, in particular, uh, as this uh, significant uh, overcapacity in China uh, exceeds its domestic uh, demand for steel. We've seen recurrent rounds of Chinese dumping of steel products into North America, but uh, actually equally importantly into other uh, regions of the world that has led to destabilization and further um, trade frictions that have uh, damaged uh, our, our trading relationships um, across the world. Uh, it's also fueled a problem that I think is going to be an increasingly big problem for us, which is um, uh, uh, in, the, in the environmental space. Chinese steel overcapacity is a major source of carbon emissions coming out of China. And as we all face, I think the common challenge of how we, uh, how we grapple with global climate change, you know, which is a major focus for the world today as we have the summit uh, occurring in, in Glasgow, Scotland. I think we need to uh, grapple with this issue of, of how uh, government policy in countries like China 
is not only having huge economic uh, consequences, but huge environmental consequences that, that affect us all. Because the reality is no matter how much we focus on reducing our emissions in the United States and in Canada and, and you know, in the steel industry, the US and Canada are among the, the cleanest steel producing uh, regions of the world, relatively low emissions. But with 57% uh, of all steel being produced worldwide in China last year, China's much higher emissions in the order of two and a half times uh, per ton of steel higher than, than what is produced in the US means that with, with all the work we're doing here, we're still facing a huge over uh, a huge problem of not only overcapacity, but also of, of, of carbon emissions that continue to grow uh, in China that, uh, that really undermine uh, all our efforts to, to address the global climate change. So addressing that issue is gonna be a, a challenge for us all. It, but it's become a it's become a, a huge supply chain challenge because every uh, every uh, industry around the, the world, every manufacturer at least, uh, wants not only to reduce their own emissions, but they want to document that their supply chain is as clean as possible. And so uh, the the over reliance by many on uh, steel from China has created supply chains that are that are very carbon intensive. And cleaning that up is not going to be easy or quick. We, know, we all know, uh, you know, the problem once once your supply chain becomes too uh, dependent on one source, that becomes a huge problem. We've seen that in semiconductors, which is really more of a, a Taiwan situation than China, although China is a major player in semiconductors as well. Uh, but we see that across uh, other sectors. Uh, my colleagues in the uh, in the European steel industry and in the European aluminum industry are right now facing a challenge of a shortage of magnesium because the the uh, Europe is almost totally dependent on China for uh, magnesium uh, inputs for for its manufacturing it's largely because the the European magnesium industry was driven out of business in the early 2000s by by dumping out of China luckily we do still have some uh, North American magnesium production uh, so we're not in the same situation but that highlights the challenges that we all face if we allow uh, too much concentration in, for any critical input uh, in, in one location, especially one with a, with a significant government intervention uh, through, through state-owned enterprises and, and uh, industrial policies. So, uh, you know, I do think uh, this is an important issue for us to work on. Unfortunately, uh, with respect to China, in some ways it's getting worse, not better. Uh, one of the challenges globally that we face in, in steel is uh, Chinese uh, uh, new investment outside of China into especially the Southeast Asian region to the ASEAN as a result of the, the Belt and Road Initiative and uh, the Chinese going out policy. And we see that, for instance, in the stainless steel sector, where uh, major, the leading Chinese uh, stainless steel producers are now building a major new production in Indonesia. You think, well, Indonesia is uh, relatively nearby. It makes sense to you from a geographic standpoint. But it's also being driven by, again, uh, a demand for a key raw material, in this case, nickel. It turns out uh, Indonesia is the world's largest source of, of, of nickel mining uh, and uh, it's become a, a major, major production center. Uh, however, as a result of uh, government policy uh, and Chinese-Indonesian government cooperation, the government of Indonesia last year banned the export of raw nickel from, from its region. So that uh, raw nickel can only be used by local production, which in large part is Chinese-owned production, where they're producing, producing stainless steel. And of course, the other key area where nickel is going to be very important is for for battery technology, for electric vehicles and other electric devices. So the problem of over-reliance on a particular region is, is now expanding into Southeast Asia. And that's a, that's a particular challenge for, um, for the stainless steel sector uh, at, you know, around the world. And it's one that's not just a North American problem, it's frankly a European problem. And there's WTO disputes ongoing to try to address that. But of course, we know WTO uh, actions are not resolved quickly or, or smoothly. So I think it's going to be incredibly important that um, 
uh, like-minded countries like the United States and Canada work together uh, to try to address some of these challenges, uh, promote policies worldwide that will avoid uh, uh, over-concentration of supply chains in one region, uh, discourage the use of government subsidies of government industrial policies, and, and look for measures that might allow us to uh, take action nationally and internationally in a coordinated fashion to, to address some of the, some of the uh, 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 consequences of this over-concentration. Uh, Perrin mentioned anti-dumping as, as one tool, and that is one that's been heavily used in the, in the steel sector. And it's one where, uh, uh, say, the, the USMCA or PUSMA uh, agreement that we reached last year and has implemented has important new uh, reforms because there are a number of key provisions in the USMCA to promote greater cooperation within North America, US, Canada, and Mexico for our customs authorities to work together to address uh, a common challenge, which is the circumvention of our trade remedy measures by China and many other countries through, through other parts of North America. And I think this type of uh, customs cooperation and increased uh, uh, sharing of data will be very important to help address that type of challenge. So I think that's, that's one key area that we need to look at. Another area uh, that we're focused on here that I just mentioned in terms of a private sector uh, solution, or uh, at least help with a solution here, um, uh, both in terms of addressing things like unfair trade, but also when we talk about how do we track uh, the potential of inputs coming in from regions, for instance, of China, where there are human rights abuses, and how can, how can we help uh, companies uh, ensure that they're not unwittingly relying on inputs from a region that's, that's that's uh, engaged in those type of human rights abuses. One of the things we've been working on jointly with our colleagues in Canada, uh, both industry and government uh, through, in a, through our North American Steel Trade Committee, as well as through the OECD Steel Committee is uh, uh, harnessing some of the new technology, digital technologies like blockchain technology that can provide a way for uh, digitally tracking and creating a secure uh, 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 documentation of the source of inputs that go into uh, further manufacturing that then can be passed on throughout the supply chain and give greater confidence as to the, the, the original source materials, whether they're coming from regions of, of concern for human rights or other reasons, or uh, whether they're, they might be uh, dumped inputs from another region that have been mislabeled. And so uh, we just recently participated in a in an OECD uh, pro a program where Canada and the US in particular highlighted the work of their respective customs authorities, but also uh, presented uh, private sector uh, uh, folks from both Canada and the United States states who have different approaches, but importantly, because they both are uh, for developing this blockchain technology and tools to use that, because they're both relying on international open standards uh, one of the very uh, interesting things was the, the, a company in Austin, Texas and a company in Toronto were able to independently demonstrate uh, how their, their different systems were in, interoperable and would work together and would provide key data that would be useful for all governments to, uh, to track the, the various steps in the supply chain. And so that's a tool that I think... Uh, that's a type of cooperation and an area where the private sector can play a role working with government where we can all work together in a way that I think will help alleviate some of the, the challenges we're, we're facing from on the supply chain front. There's still going to be a lot more work for governments to do, but I think uh, that type of government industry cooperation could be very, uh, very effective. So uh, appreciate the opportunity to be with you today and I look forward to answering any questions. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, Baron, did you want to have any uh, response or go right into questions? Well, let's let's go straight to the discussion. Okay, sure. I, I I guess from my perspective, we might not be having this conference if it weren't for uh, COVID nineteen and and how that exposed uh, really significant weaknesses in the supply chain. I guess 
um, and Perrin, I think you you touched on this and really Kevin did too, but um, with the recent focus on supply chain, do you, do you see a way for real efforts on the part of corporations and um, to manufacture more strategic, uh, strategically important um, products within North America? And, and can that happen without incentives? Can it be just based on the experience that we've had in the last uh, 18 months? Um, do you want me to go first? Do you want Kevin sure. to start? Okay. Um, I think there's a pretty powerful incentive based on the experience that we've had. Um, I think any business would be foolish not to take stock of the experience of the last 19 months and ask itself, uh, how am I organized? Uh, does the system that I'm using of just-in-time delivery, for example, relying on supply chains that, that stretch across the other side of the world, is this still as valid as it was pre-COVID? Um, in addition to that, governments need to take stock. The Canadian Chamber has been pressing the, our federal government that as soon as we get through the other side of this, as soon as we get to the other shore, the government should be striking an arm's length group, not something run by government itself, to take a look at the lessons learned from, uh, from COVID. And uh, the, the point shouldn't be to assign blame it should be to look at what was done right, what was done wrong. Uh, there are, the one certainty that we have is there will be future crises. It could, be a, it could be another pandemic that would make us wistful looking back at COVID. Uh, it could be a, a climate crisis. It could be cyber terrorism. It could be other types of terrorism. We don't know what, it's going, what it might be, but we do know that there will be more crises. And now is the time that we need to look at what are the lessons learned and uh, what sort of changes should we be making? Well, one of those is the question of the sustainability of supply chains. It is not practical uh, or wise to assume we can, that we can reshore everything. We would simply price ourselves out of international markets if we were to do that. But we do have to ask ourselves, uh, are, there, are there goods and services that we need to produce ourselves either in our own countries or in collaboration and partnership with each other, where we know that, we're, that, that we can sustain hard times. An example of where we do that is the uh, defense industrial base. I'm a former defense minister in Canada. Uh, Canada and the United States worked together to ensure that in times of crisis, that we would be able to supply each other with, with essential goods. Um, we, I think we need to define our security more broadly than simply, are the Russians going to attack uh, we need to be looking at our security from, uh, from disease, security from, uh, from climate crisis and from other threats as well, and, and uh, make a judgment as to, as to what it is we need to bring here. There are other options though, James, as you're aware as well for suppliers, to, for customers to look at. They can look at building inventory uh, if, they're, if they have to deal with a short-term problem. And they can look at diversifying sources of supply as opposed to having to, uh, to uh, completely reshore, and we can nearshore. Uh, all of those are tools, but we need to take a very uh, analytical approach, both company by company and government by government in terms of, of where we go from here. But you didn't expect an answer that long to so short a question. Oh, that's, that's terrific. Good, uh, good thoughts there. Uh, Kevin, you wanna jump in? Uh, yes. Uh, you know, I I agree with much of what Perrin has said. I mean, I do think uh, I do think as a result of COVID, uh, companies are looking to diversify their supply chains where, where that can be done in an economical fashion. And for you know, there for many there may there are many goods where, of course, it, if as long as you don't put your entire reliance on just what is the absolute cheapest uh, and quickest way to get a good a good here, you you can. You can find some alternative supply chains. There are areas though where that's that's uh, hard to do without some much greater level of government involvement. Semiconductors comes to mind, I and mean, we and I know there was some discussion in the previous panel about this. Uh, uh, we are undertaking an effort in the United States through, through the Congress to to look at putting um, some government money in to try to incentivize the building of more semiconductor capacity in the U.S. 
uh, in, a, in a previous position, I, I worked closely with the U.S. semiconductor industry uh, more than 20 years ago. And, uh, you know, unfortunately, there were, there were some decisions made many years ago that led to a lot of that uh, production capacity moving off, offshore. Uh, I think it's, there is a role for government to try to assist, but I think we've got to be honest, you know, we, we can't simply have government trying to subsidize its way to creating alternatives everywhere. I, first of all, I don't, I don't think there is enough money uh, alone from the US government that can, that can ensure we can rebuild a, a semiconductor uh, industry fully in the US. But uh, looking at all the tools the government has, opportunities for um, uh, where governments purchase uh, goods to use government procurement uh, you know, incentives consistent with our international obligations can be, can be helpful. Uh, I, I think for very critical items, nat national security-based items, where you know government should insist that either there is capability in our market or in our close uh, allied countries. Uh, you know, the defense industrial base between the U.S. and Canada is one that's been have been uh, you know written into our law as a, as, as the recognition of that important relationship, uh, and uh, and so that that's that's obviously important. Um, and and you know we have to I think encourage uh, companies to to think about uh, you know more creatively more creatively about what they can do. So there, uh, I think there's been some increased focus on it. I think we still have a lot more work to be done. Uh, and uh, building a coalition of like-minded countries, uh, especially like in the, in the climate space, I think could be useful. That's we just announced uh, an agreement between the U.S. and the EU this past weekend on steel that includes a, 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 a plan to develop over the next two years, a new uh, global arrangement in, in steel that would put an emphasis on not just addressing over capacity, but also addressing uh, carbon intensity to address the climate challenge. And the, that, in, that arrangement is intended and explicitly provides for the bringing in of other like-minded countries. And so I think that's an area where I think Canada and the U.S. Uh, share a lot of common interests and could be another area where we could cooperate and perhaps uh, alleviate some of the supply chain challenges going forward. James, if I could just piggyback on what Kevin was saying about, about the role of government, sure. critical minerals. You know, can our two countries afford to allow ourselves to be dependent upon China for, for critical minerals, given China's proclivity toward uh, toward mixing up uh, trade matters and, and, uh, and politics. Now, this is a matter of national security. Only our governments can, uh, can fully address that and they need to provide leadership on that. We need, uh, we need a North American strategy to ensure security supply of these critical minerals. I, I agree. We have our, our own issue at at Cleveland Cliffs that we've dealt with and, and being um, the only uh, North American producer of uh, grain oriented uh, electrical steel. And, you know, it's, it's both a, an issue of getting the product from somewhere else, but also uh, concerns about national security and how that could impact our ability to fix our electrical grid, um, you know, uh, going forward and, and those kinds of issues. So um, I, I totally agree that um, those national security concerns need, need to come in as well. I guess the, the next thing I wanted to touch back on I, again is um, ESG um, because that's near and dear to uh, um, my role here at, at Cliffs as well. And really, um, trying to promote a, a level playing field. Um, and I don't know um, if there's um, enough emphasis on the impact on reliance of, of major corporations on goods produced in China. And what, you know, is there more that can be done? Is there, you know, more investment direction um, that, that could be done is, um, what, what incentives need to be uh, put out there in order to uh, make sure that um, we are on a level playing field when it comes to various goods? 
So if if either of you can comment on that, that'd be great. Uh, James, I'm happy to uh, lead off there. Uh, yeah, I think uh, you know the ESG emphasis is a very important one and can play a very uh, 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 you know active and a productive role in in encouraging companies to think more broadly about uh, you know, where they're sourcing their their products. Uh, we do think it's going to be important not to be looking, you know, obviously uh, I've already mentioned climate's going to be critical. Uh, uh, you know, human rights is going to be very important. I think uh, the reliance on uh, goods from uh, state-owned enterprises, uh, I think is another area where I think that a greater, uh, greater exposure uh, in the, within the investment community could be very, very valuable. One of the challenges that we see in a, a downstream sector here in North America is in the rail car industry. Uh, the Chinese uh, government a number of years ago uh, merged together its two leading uh, state-owned enterprises uh, building rail cars to create a, a single national champion, the uh, China, China Railway Rolling Stock Corporation, CRRC, which has uh, gone on a, a bit of a, of a tear of seeking to uh, acquire uh, other producers around the world. Um, and there was, it suddenly became a, a major uh, national security concern uh, in the United States that there might be uh, uh, local governments buying uh, rail cars, not actually fully understanding that they were sourcing from a Chinese government-owned entity uh, that was now operating in many different parts of the world uh, through its various acquisitions. So a uh, further uh, disclosure of that relationship, I think will be critical to identifying a potential national security challenge given the, the importance of our frail, freight railway system for moving uh, goods, moving food, moving other critical materials. So I think that's another area where, uh, where uh, increased uh, disclosure and, uh, uh, and and attention by the investment community could be, be helpful on top of the, the very important areas of human rights, of, of climate, which as I mentioned, I think will be uh, of, of, of critical importance and uh, and looking at the full supply chain for on climate. You know, one of the challenges uh, we see is that uh, uh, companies right now are forced to, in most cases are reporting on their scope one and scope two emissions, their direct uh, embedded emissions of, uh, of carbon and their the purchases of, of electricity and what's embedded in that electricity. But there are also scope three emissions, which are important, uh, especially where you're uh, purchasing perhaps uh, inputs that come from other regions of the world. And if you don't account for the carbon emissions embedded in the production of those inputs, uh, you may be missing a big, big slice of the overall uh, carbon emissions that are in that supply chain. So I think expanding that uh, that disclosure in the climate space is also going to be very important. I agree. There there really is a story to tell here, um, and we have to do better about getting that that message out. So, um, Perrin, you want to jump in? Yeah, but let me simply preface it uh, by saying that that we have to be careful about green protectionism which is a very real possibility as well, where, where the green that people are interested in is more greenbacks than, than the environment, and where the goal is more protectionist of, uh, related to competition than it is with, with uh, the environment. Having said that, though, there is no question that, uh, that because of modern trade agreements and how they've evolved, because of political concerns that exist in... in uh, in the democratic countries because of growing concerns over the environment, uh, because of greater concerns that consumers have and in, in their purchasing patterns, uh, the pressures on companies to be looking at where they source, uh, where they source from and what their own practices are as related to ESG goals is going to grow. And uh, it'll come directly from government. It'll also come from, uh, from consumers and from investors and from lenders as well. And certainly the advice I'd be giving to our members in the Canadian Chamber is that our goal shouldn't be to compete with China on the basis of who can produce low quality goods at the lowest price. 
but to move up the value chain and to compete on the basis of where you can have quality value added goods that that uh, that are produced in the highest possible standards. That's the area where where countries like the like Canada, and the United States can compete far more effectively than on producing poor quality materials at low prices. Right, it shouldn't be a race to the bottom. <laughs> Absolutely not. It, it, the pressure should be on us to move the other way and to drag the others up. That's um, right. If, if, we, if we believe, as I do, that climate change is existential, then it's simply not acceptable that some countries are sitting it out and uh, want, to, uh, want to trade the environment for, for, uh, uh, for commercial gain. And China would, would top that list at this point. Uh, same on human rights. Um, I think the international community does need to let does need to set standards that are the price of admission for those countries wanting to be considered uh, as full members of the international community. Agreed. Really, all, all important considerations as we um, in the private sector look to uh, evaluate our supply chain uh, choices. So. Well, I do have a question that um, came in through uh, the audience, and so I'll I'll turn to that uh, question now for both of you. It's uh, regarding trade secrets and intellectual property, specifically theft and misuse in that area. What issues are your constituents uh, continuing to see, and what can be done by both companies and policymakers to counteract Chinese actions on that front? Yes, you know, uh, IPR infringement, trade secret uh, theft is uh, is an, er an area that affects, I think, every industry uh, around the world. Certainly, it's been a major, it's a major challenge with China, although it is not only a, a China problem. And I I do think that uh, in the increased attention to uh, enforcement of intellectual property rights through uh, uh, international agreements through uh, trade measures as appropriate is going to be uh, is going to be critical. Uh, uh, a lot of the time, though, a, a key part of that is is uh, ensuring that uh, that uh, that theft be be made known, that there be clear information provided when when goods are are, are counterfeit. And too often, you know, goods are coming in. Uh, to to the United States market, uh, and 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 they're not really being uh, properly uh, uh, analyzed for that. That's it's it's a difficult, of course, for the the customs folks at the border. In many cases, to, you know, how can they tell if a, if a good has been mislabeled and steal? You find it uh, with you know a pipe that is uh, labeled as meeting. Uh, certain specifications for use in the oil and gas industry that is it's just fraudulent. And of course, there the biggest threat is really a safety one. That that, that good is used then in a in a in a uh, oil and gas facility that it's not up to up to the standards. It, it could burst and it cause uh, huge environmental damage. Um, this is an area, as I mentioned earlier, that the, this notion of using blockchain technology to create a an unbreakable chain of of, of digital documentation of the the source of, of product and that the product at each stage is, uh, we know its provenance and we know whether it's meeting standards. It may be part of the solution, uh, something that will be uh, a way that the private sector can help and make it easier for the government than to police this area. Uh, and so that's something we're, we're very encouraged by uh, because uh, otherwise, you know, I think, you know, frankly, the, the, the amount of, 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 of Trade secret theft and uh, just uh, fraudulent mislabeling of product is, is so great that it, it could easily overwhelm the government officials if they're left to do it on their own. So I think that's where uh, industry needs to help government to police that important area. James, I fully uh, agree with Kevin. What what Kevin has said, uh, I'd simply add to that 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 uh, the United States may be big enough that it can go it alone uh, on a lot of this. Canada certainly is not. Maybe the EU, maybe the EU is large enough to be able to uh, to be able to police it. But again, Canada can't. Uh, it's an argument for those people who play by the rules to work together and to 
have a concerted approach to dealing with people who are the scofflaws and the, the cheats. It's not only the Chinese, uh, industrial espionage is being carried out by many other state sponsors as well as, as, well as private sector companies. And uh, we need to root it out and we need to have concerted international action to deal with that. Um, I simply want to make a pitch for internationalism and, and for uh, countries with common goals who play by common standards, common rules, uh, working together to try to deal with, with uh, uh, people who have complete disregard for international rules. Um, just to, to uh, give you an example of how egregious it can be, and I'm, I'm sure everybody has their own example. I remember a few years ago visiting our ambassador in Beijing and he mentioned going to a reception that was held for the Canadians by, uh, by the Chinese government. And uh, the host said, uh, you know, just in honor of, of the Canadians who are here today, we are serving Canadian ice wine. Uh, the, the Canadians said, well, could we take a look at the bottle? And uh, on the label of the bottle, there was, it said product of Niagara. And there was a very nice picture of the Rocky Mountains on it. Uh, this was made in somebody's garage and they scammed the government of China. Um, this, there is still a lot of brazen uh, theft, counterfeiting, uh, theft of intellectual property taking place, and we need to have concerted international action to deal with it. Agreed, thank you. I guess one, one more uh, question, I think we have about um, 10 minutes uh, before uh, we would wrap up. So. Um, you were talking about international cooperation, I guess, um, looking at regional cooperation. Now we've been under the USMCA for a little more than a year. Um, I'm interested in knowing whether you see ways that um, that, that uh, agreement can facilitate uh, the US, Canada and, and Mexico to address uh, common challenges associated with supply chain uh, disruptions and uh, potentially counter China's uh, aspirations to further grow its economic influence. Yes, yeah, so I'll say uh, from our perspective, we're, we were uh, big supporters of the US MCA uh, renegotiation, FUSMA, uh, TMEC, for our colleagues in in, uh, in Mexico, and importantly, as uh, when the the North American steel industry uh, uh, thought about what its priorities were at the beginning of that negotiation, we actually presented thought about them and presented a, a consolidated set of North American wide steel industry objectives. So we didn't have U.S. or American steel industry objectives and Canadian steel industry objectives and Mexican steel industry objectives, we had common North American one. And one of the key ones was to facilitate greater cooperation by uh, our customs authorities. And uh, it's, you know, it's an area that uh, we, I think we have long thought was important. It was challenging though, I'll tell you for many years because uh, customs authorities, they are first and foremost, they're in law, law enforcement. Uh, at the border, and they and they they have uh, a lot of concerns about maintaining confidentiality of information they gather, and they, they have to protect you know uh, information from uh, individual companies, importers as they come in, uh, and so finding a way to get the, the the different authorities to really not only cooperate but to share information was a bit of a challenge. But over the course of the negotiation, and we had established a North American steel uh, dialogue for customs authorities. There were a series of meetings that I think helped break the ice and develop a level of, of comfort uh, so that we have in the final USMCA provisions that not only can they share information, but if one customs authority is, uh, presents evidence to another authority within North America of a counterfeit or a, a, a circumvention of a trade remedy, they can request uh, permission to enter the other uh, government's uh, territory and join with the local customs authority to, to undertake a joint effort at investigation of, of, uh, of potentially uh, infringing goods coming out of the border. And that's worked. There have been, there have been instances of, of joint 
customs cooperation and then enforcement action. And I think that's, uh, that's really uh, a, a very positive development. Um, I think there's, you know, it, 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 we're probably still only at the early stages on that, but I, I do think that uh, level of cooperation that's been uh, provided for, sort of expanded on in, in the USMCA is, is one, of, one of the real strengths of that agreement that's not as well known as it should be. And uh, we're, you know, we're, we're actively using the steel sector, but I think it could be one that could be very valuable in, in other sectors as well. Great, Kevin, thanks for highlighting that. Aaron? Um, James, could we use COSMA or USMCA? Yes. The question is, is there the political will at the levels of our, our heads of government to make it happen? Uh, I was part of the government that brought in the Canada-US Free Trade Agreement and subsequently NAFTA and uh, believe very firmly in it. And at that time, the leaders of our countries felt that, that there was an idea of North America that we were stronger together with the, with the either in the bilateral relationship with Canada and the United States or with the trilateral relationship with Mexico than we would be if we were separately. Now, I still believe in it very firmly and I believe the vast majority of Canadians do. Uh, I think there's a feeling that's unrequited love at this point and um, that, that uh, the concept of North America has fallen out of fashion to a significant extent, both in Washington and in uh, Mexico City, I hope it can be uh, can be renewed. I think, particularly when we look at some of the threats that we're dealing with, such as uh, uncompetitive measures from uh, from China that we were talking about earlier, we should be looking in our own neighborhood and saying, how do we strengthen the North, the North American industrial base? Uh, how do we develop synergies working to each with each other? that will help to strengthen us, whether in terms of our national security or in terms of our economies or in terms of our social cohesion. Um, and, but it requires work. And uh, at this point, I think the relationship has fallen into a, a certain degree of disrepair. The, the other comment I would make at the risk of being provocative at the last, at the last minute, and I apologize if, um, if it seems that way, um, is simply that, that now, there doesn't appear to be an idea of North America. If you were to walk out in the streets of our capitals and ask the ordinary citizen you bumped into, what's a North American? The answer would be somebody who lives in North America. The Europeans feel their, their North America, they, they, they feel their Europeanness very differently. And a German doesn't feel that, that being European is antithetical to being German. They see it as an expression of their personality. Uh, what we desperately need to do in North America is to, is to understand the fundamental that, that partnering with each other, uh, having shared goals and working together to achieve those goals is what mature people and mature companies and mature countries do. It's not a threat to, uh, to our independence or to our, um, our uh, sovereignty. It enhances it. It's an expression of it. And uh, we should be embracing it, in my view. Thanks for those uh, thoughts, Perrin. It, uh, it, it almost sounds like a jumping off place for the, uh, <laughs> the conference in the spring. Um, so I don't know if either of you have any, any thoughts on um, how we continue this conversation and, and make it useful um, with Coosley. We do have a conference coming up uh, next spring, where we're going to, I think, dive deeper into this topic. And I think um, Larry asked a question at the end of his um, panel session. So I'll, I'll ask the same question to you. Um, do you see the, the benefit of continuing this conversation on the, on the private sector side? Uh, yeah, I'll say from our end, yes, of course. Uh, we we uh, we highly value um, you know the, the relationship we have with our colleagues in Canada, and we think it's uh, it's a very important one. We are close allies and uh, share you know common visions, uh, common legal approaches, common uh, you know values, and I think it's uh, it's very important. That, that we continue to work together to find ways that uh, communicate uh, on key issues and find ways to partner. 
and I, I think I think there is still a strong uh, feeling of, of that uh, that that partnership and uh, those shared values. And I think I think we, you know, continued communication will help foster that for the future. I would, uh, um, James. I would echo what Kevin was saying. Uh, when I was I was uh, foreign minister for a time in Canada as well. I used to say only half jokingly that uh, Canada has two international relationships. There's the relationship with the United States and the relationship with the rest of the world. Uh, you're simply too important for us not to work at the, uh, at the relationship. And I believe firmly that we're stronger together than we are separately. And I also believe that, that uh, you know, we're in the same boat and we can't shoot a hole in the other guy's half of the boat without the whole thing sinking. It makes sense for us to, to work together to, to strengthen the structure and look for ways in which we can leverage it to the advantage of, of our citizens on both sides of the border. Well said, well said. So with that, I'm going to uh, thank our panelists, Perrin Beatty and Kevin Dempsey. Um, it's been terrific to have you share your knowledge and expertise in the private sector area and uh, really, really appreciate your participation. So thank you so much. Pleasure, thank you. All right, and thank you, James. Um, as a strong member of our executive committee and uh, also one of uh, leaders of one of Cleveland's most important uh, companies that in your position as executive vice president and chief legal officer at Cleveland Cliffs. So thank you for your time and your interest. Um, thank you to both our Excellent panelists for your wonderful comments. Uh, we really appreciate you taking the time to be with us and we hope to have you back in the future. Uh, at this point, I will turn it back over to uh, Steve Petrus, our US National Director for uh, some final comments. Thanks, Ted. And yeah, I wish we could have a virtual round of applause for everyone for this outstanding presentation today. Uh, thanks go to Minister John Layton of the Canadian Embassy in Washington, DC. Vice President Anna Ashton of the US-China Business Council, Professor Pittman Potter of the Allard School of Law at the University of British Columbia, President Perrin Beatty of the Canadian Chamber of Commerce, and President Kevin Dempsey of the American Iron and Steel Institute. Thank you all for your participation. Also thanks, of course, to our moderators, Larry Herman and James Graham. Everybody did outstanding work here. Please save the date for the Canada United States Law Institute Annual Conference of April 21 and April 22 in Cleveland, where we will take a deep look into global supply chains. And again, look at the Canadian and US approach to addressing strategic sourcing, access, delivery, transport, security, and the vulnerabilities across the globe. Finally, uh, great thanks go to the Wilson Center's Canada Institute for co-hosting this event with us. We greatly appreciate cooperating with them and working together. So until next April, we stand adjourned. Thank you.